For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Peter, and I'll do a, a, a very brief uh, little talk, and then we can chat or hang out or whatever we feel. If that's all right. <laughs> So what this is, what's going on here, is not what you think it is. Which wouldn't be a problem, except that typically we think it is. Typically we think we have some kind of a handle on what's going on here. We think we have some kind of a handle on what this is, what we are, how it all works, how we fit into it, how to engage in life, all these kinds of things. But it happens that what this is cannot be what you think it is because it's impossible for human thought to grasp what this is. <clears throat> and this simple fact, this simple misunderstanding, the fact that we typically don't know what this is and think we do, is the entirety of the spiritual problem, the entirety of spiritual difficulty, spiritual confusion, and of course indicates the, paves the way for the spiritual solution, which is to realize, A, that this is not what you think it is, and then B, to engage with it as it actually is, which is beyond thought. It cannot be thought. You cannot get a handle on what this is. With any kind of conceptualization, it cannot be done. But fortunately, it doesn't need to be done because you are non-conceptual. You are not a concept. You actually exist. You are not a product of your thoughts or your ideas. You are an intrinsically existent being. And that being is completely transrational, doesn't make any sense, is indescribable, doesn't conform to any human notions or any human philosophies, it is exactly what it is, and it is one with what this is, so since you are what this is, you can engage with it on a one-to-one -one basis in terms of how it actually is, which will be non-conceptual. In fact, of course, we're all doing this all the time. But the confusion sets in is that we don't realize this. We typically may find ourselves constrained to a greater or lesser degree with grappling, by grappling with our life, with our existence, in terms of what we think it is. And this generates unending confusion because there's an absolute disjunction, absolute mismatch between any idea you can have of this and what it actually is. So when you try to approach this in terms of your ideas, no matter how sophisticated, you're, it's, gonna, it's not going to work ultimately. It's going to prove to be a big mess. And this, and this basically gives us the human situation as, as we can find it. <laughs> anyway, by looking around. <laughs> so, our situation is somewhat like A dream, in the sense that in a dream, typically, you'll find yourself in a world that's more or less, seems to be more or less consistent or coherent, it seems to actually be there in some sense. You seem to actually be in it in some sense. There seems to be various events, circumstance happening to some degree that you get interested in or caught up in or have some kind of, kind of meaningful interaction within it. And, but if you take the dream on, the, in the, on that level, in those terms, you'll be completely misunderstanding your situation because, of course, the other half of the dream is the fact that you're asleep. Mm -hmm. And the dream is a fantasy that is happening in your consciousness. But if you're unaware of that, if you're just in the dream taking it on face value, taking it as, if, as superficially as if it was just what it seemed to be, just this, this existent world that you existed within and some strange situations going on, if you would be completely misunderstanding what's actually happening. And this is exactly analogous to our situation here. We find ourselves here, apparently in this world, um, 
you know, which we have engaged with, there's all sorts of meaningfulness to one degree or another, and then there's certain urgency, certain importances, self-preservation, you know, um, f- achieving goals, winning friends and influencing people, you know, <laughs> making money, having a lot of sex, you know, whatever our personal inclination pulls us toward. But, again, like a dream, if we don't understand the context that this exists in, we'll completely be missing what's actually going on. Or another another good example is like a movie. If you were watching a movie, completely absorbed in the movie, and you're just in the movie, you know, things seem to be a certain way. This, you know, the plot seems to be going on, the characters seem to be doing what they're doing, there seems to be a certain amount of urgency and importance around what's going on, and so on and so forth. But then if you relax and look around you, you notice, wait a minute, I'm sitting in a room with a bunch of other people looking at this screen that has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the apparent plot line that seems to be going on in the movie. It's a whole different context. And in fact, the movie isn't even there. The movie is a flat display of light that's being projected from a room up over your head, which has absolutely nothing to do with the apparent plot of the movie that's going on. And likewise, we find ourselves in a similar situation here. This world that you experience as your experience, this body that you experience as your body, all your sensoria, or your thoughts, all of these are phenomena that are um, completely dependent upon, let's call it a whole other system, that, which is what you actually are. And very much in the same sense that a dream is a phenomenon that's wholly dependent upon a whole another system, which is the system of the dreaming consciousness, which which is one. It's intrinsically one with what is appearing, but it's entirely separate from it and independent from it. And likewise, this apparent environment that you seem to exist in, in this body you seem to exist in, in this circumstances that you seem to be um, involved in to a greater or lesser degree are all (coughs) dependent upon another system that is largely invisible, largely unacknowledged, largely ignored, completely accessible. It's not something that is not available to us, it's not something that's not accessible to us, but we typically discredit it because it doesn't seem to be very interesting. Just like when you're sitting in the movie theater, it's, it's it's kind of a dark, boring room with not a lot going on, so of course you pay attention to the screen. And when you when you're dreaming, your sleep is just kind of a a blob, whatever blank black space with subtle, very subtle energy presence or whatever, which doesn't seem particularly interesting. So of course you get interested in the dream. It's a lot more going on. It's more things are popping, things are exciting, things are interesting. Whereas when you look at sleep, it's you know on the surface of it, it's a lot less demonstrative. It's a lot less absorbing, and yet. It is the true event. It is the context within which dreams actually exist, within which dreams make sense. It's the basis for dreams. Without <coughs> without a sleeping consciousness, there would be no dream. And the sleeping consciousness is not dependent upon the dream, but the dream is entirely dependent upon the sleeping consciousness. Likewise, in this circumstance, <coughs> this bubble of experience that you inhabit that seems to be a world, seems to be a body, seems to be all sorts of phenomena and entities and interaction, is dependent upon what you actually are, but what you actually are is not at all dependent upon it. <clears throat> this fact is readily discoverable by simply noticing, simply discovering what you actually are. Well, how do you do that? So, you, so uh, here's, here's a dreaming, here's a person in a dream saying, and, and someone walks up to them and says, you're not really here, this is a dream. And, and, and what do you say? You say, what? You know, what are you talking about? A dream? What's that mean? I'm here, this is the world. You know, I'm talking to you. Right? So how do you, from a dream, how do you investigate sleep? It doesn't seem to be particularly accessible. It seems to be very different. And yet, of course, a, a dream 
is completely interpenetrated by sleep. A dream is made of sleep. Uh, you know, sleep is not distant from a dream. Sleep is where the dream is happening. So sleep is completely present, even even as there is all this dream present. And likewise, what you really are is completely present right here, even though there's all of this display present, um, which is not entirely what you are. It, it, in a certain sense, it is what you are, in the same sense that a dream is what you are. The dream, when you dream at night, the dream is made of you. So the dream is not other than you. So it's not like the dream is not you. And yet you are not limited by the apparent circumstances that present themselves as the dream. You are the sleeping consciousness. You are that which can generate any dream. So you are much more than the dream. And yet the dream is you. But it's a version of you. It's a limited partial display of you, let's, let's call it, say. Um, that you are not limited to, that you are not trapped within, um, that you are not dependent upon. You can, you can have horrible things happen to you in a dream, and the dreaming consciousness is fine. You know, you can get tortured and murdered in a dream, and the dreaming consciousness is fine. It doesn't get hurt. You know, you can have wild success and exquisite, you know, um, you know, ecstatic experiences in the dream, and the dreaming consciousness is just there sleeping away. So the dreaming consciousness doesn't gain or lose anything by what happens in the dream. It's independent of it. It's not vulnerable to it. It's not dependent upon the circumstances that seem to present themselves in the dream. And in this situation, exactly the same arrangement prevails. What you actually are is not dependent upon what seems to be happening. It's not dependent upon these circumstances that are here. And yet what what you actually are is right here. It is. Um, it shows up as what we call consciousness, what we call awareness. It shows up as all of these subtle energy phenomena that we typically discount. You know, subtle vibes, subtle moods, subtle sort of flavors that waft in the background of our consciousness that we don't have words for. We don't have any name for these things. Um, and yet all of these things that we typically discredit as just sort of background noise in our experience are profound indicators of what we actually are. And by paying attention to, by noticing this aspect, the sort of background quality of our experience, we can gain very direct access to what we actually are. And, and if we're fortunate, we can stumble onto the actual perspective and come to see very directly, wow, you know, I'm not in this. This is in me. This world is in me. These people are in me. This body is in me. I'm not in this body. And we can discover these, these facts very, very directly and simply by paying attention to the full range of what is present in our experience. Indeterminacy. What is it? Um, so suppose uh, you're suppose you're in a spaceship 500 miles over Earth, over, you know, geosync orbit over Africa, and you look down at Africa, and someone points out that that's Africa, this account, and you look at it, and you get, okay, I know what Africa is. You know, you look at it, you see the shape of it, you see, the, you know, sort of shades of green and brown and whatever, you know, and you look at it and you go, okay, that's Africa, I get it, that's Africa. So then, you go down and you're flying, you know, a mile above Africa, flying around the continent, and you go, wow, there's a whole lot here that I didn't really notice before, Africa's a lot more than I thought it was. And then you go down and you get in the Land Rover, and you start driving around Africa from town to town and, you know, road to road, and you go, Jesus Christ, there's so much here. You know, I thought I knew what Africa was. I looked at it, and there was just this shape, and that was Africa. But now look at all this incredible stuff. When does it end? And then you get out your magnifying glass, and you get on your hands and knees, and you go from one end, from one coast to the other of Africa. And by that time, of course, you're stark raving loony, and you died hundreds of years ago. But... Assuming the miraculous, you, you, are, you are very, very impressed with the extent of what Africa is. 
and I, you know we won't go into the electron microscope and the, and the atom smasher and so on and so forth but you get this principle of you know what prevents noticing infinity what prevents noticing indeterminacy is this principle of oh I've got enough information now I know what it is it's rounding off so you're with any phenomena in your experience and you, and you, 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 you have absorbed a, a, an arbitrary amount of what it seems to be presenting and then you close the door you say okay now I know what it is and you close the door and you draw a picture of it and a name and that's this and you bang you've got, it, you've got it down you know what that is until of course you look closer and you know gosh you know, there's a lot more here so this, this essential principle of moreness is absolutely inherent in experience itself. Anything whatsoever that can appear in experience is literally infinite in terms of getting a handle on what it actually is. Um, so, but of course we're all very familiar with this principle of, of doing this. We do it quite spontaneously and automatically. Oh, you know, I know what a light is, I know what a computer is. Because you sort of, oh, I've got enough information, I sort of know what it is, and then I stop looking. And at that point, a limitedness sets in, an inertness sets in. You know, it's, it's this dull, lifeless thing that's a computer, and it's, you know, sitting here, and it, it's pretty much the same next time I look at it as it was last time I looked at it as it is now. And so it's all sort of compartmentalized and collapsed down into certainty, into stability. <laughs> and yet experientially... I could never experience this computer the same way twice. Absolutely impossible. It's en- this computer is absolutely endless. It's endless in the moment. It's endless from moment to moment. It's endless in any way. Um, <clears throat> this is discovering this, noticing this principle and experience is really the dividing line between living in, being stuck in an imaginary world which is limited, limiting, which will generate a sense of suffering, generate a sense of frustration, generate a sense of, of boringness, of lifelessness, all these sorts of qualities. And, no, in, and on the contrary, noticing this open-endedness opens the door to endless you know, spontaneity, vitality, uh, excitement, uh, 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 stimulation, meaningfulness, complete unlimitedness i.e. unstuckness you know, the, the possibility of stuckness in this context is, is not doesn't compute it's absolute gibberish it's like yeah well, how can something be stuck what's going to be impeding it what's going to be holding it back what's going to be blocking it when everything is infinitely open ended um, so now this the important point another important point is this is not an abstract principle this is a concrete principle of experience itself, it's in operation always in experience. Uh, you know, in real time, right now, right here, uh, anything you're experiencing is infinitely open-ended, and it's quite possible to notice this phenomenon. And when you do, the, your experience and the and the world you seem to inhabit, and your you yourself, and so on and so forth, reveal themselves as as, as, as astoundingly different then you've always taken them to them. Um, so this is a very powerful, an exceedingly powerful principle. And again, it's not an abstraction. We're talking something that's extremely concrete. This is an aspect of experiencing itself, which is never not the case. It's always how it is. Um, this is the reason I called my website uh, The Open Doorway, because experience itself the door is never closed. Anything that seems to present it, an experience is always a, 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 a doorway to moreness. And and you, you are with anything in the experience, and there's more. And, and there's another door, there's more. There's more. Forever. There's no bottom, there's no... You can't get to the bottom of anything. You can't get to the final, finite experience of anything. It cannot be done. And this principle is very powerful it's extremely powerful in terms of revealing what this is what you are and in the process of course getting you completely unstuck from your confusion about what this is not that you may have a tendency to hold 
I'd like to introduce a, a technical term at this point. Um, anytime you take anything to be something, in other words, you close the door on it, you, you take it as, you know, typically unconsciously, we do this very automatically, you take something to be something and, oh, that's what it is. In other words, you're not letting yourself notice directly and in real time the open-endedness, the essential open-endedness of it. Um, the technical term for that phenomena is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this is what bullshit means. So we get lost in bullshit when we take anything to be something. Because you can't find what anything is because it's all absolutely bottomless. It's all absolutely infinitely open-ended. There's no limit to, to the richness of experience that is presented in any aspect of experience. This applies, of course, on every level, sensory, thought, subtle vibes, whatever. And it's irrespective of scale. You know, a tiny flash of light is exactly as infinite and contains exactly as much unending, open-ended information as the continent of Africa does. We're in a very fortunate situation. Because we only have one problem. <laughs> it's only possible to have one problem. And we're, the reason we're fortunate is because we also have the solution to that one problem. only problem we can have is misunderstanding what this is, misunderstanding what's going on here, misunderstanding what you are, what your world is, what your life consists of. <clears throat> All problems that people can think they have boils down to this one basic problem of misunderstanding what this is, misunderstanding what you are. <coughs> and fortunately, um, this already is what it is. So we can discover what it is. We can, we can correct our erroneous interpretations and our misunderstandings of what we think this is by looking at what this is and discovering what it actually is, which turns out to be the answer to all of our problems, i.e. there's basically this one problem of misinterpretation. <clears throat> this mis misinterpretation takes the form of a worldview. It takes the form of a, uh, a whole conceptual gestalt which consists of what you think you are, what you think the world is, what you think is happening, what you think your history is, what you think is in, you know, where you think you're going, where you think you've been, what you think all the elements that make up your life and your world are, all of that, that entire huge worldview exists only in your imagination. It's the only place it exists. <clears throat> but fortunately, your experience is real. Your experience is of reality always, it, or, it already is, it always has been, and always will be. All we need to do is look at what our experience is and discover that it does not support what we've taken it to be. It does not support our erroneous worldview. It does not support our interpretation of what we are and of what this world is. <coughs> now, it's easy to see that we do look at this all the time, and yet we find it effortlessly easy to maintain our worldviews. <laughs> so, so what's the trick? You know, what's the angle? How, how'd you do it? <clears throat> Part of the difficulty is that the nature of what this is is very subtle. It is somewhat elusive, and Part of, the as part of the aspect of the nature of what it is is that it can easily appear to be 
in accordance with your expectations of what you expect to see. In other words, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think life is a certain way, it's easy to see it as a certain way. You know, you wake up in a bad mood and you think, boy, life is just this horrible thing and you can go out and you find this, this pathetic life we're living and people are being cruel to each other and people are cutting you off in traffic and you, you know, you can't get what you want and, I mean, it's just, you know, it's easy to see. On the other hand, you wake up in a good mood and it's easy to see all the things that are right with, with your life and all the things that are right with your world. And very simplistically, <coughs> the same principle applies much more subtly in terms of what we think things are, in terms of what we think we are, what we think our life is. You know, um, for one reason or another, we have found ourselves with a worldview that's been, you know, we've been programmed into it by society, by our parents, by, you know, the accidents of our experience and all of this. So for one reason or another here we are where we think we know what things are we think we know what we are we think we know what life consists of to one extent or another <clears throat> now our great advantage is that this worldview exists only in our imagination and we can access our direct experience and ultimately all of our direct experience but explicitly vast portions of our direct experience are outside of that world view and this is our great opportunity so if you can you can look at something in your life that you already have a strong maybe unconscious opinion of it you already think you know what it is and that's going to be challenging because you're going to tend to see what you expect to see you're going to tend to see it the way you have been seeing it more or less but there are areas in our life where we don't have ideas what, what they are. There's areas in our life where we're, we're very neutral or very wide open as to exactly what's going on and we don't have a strong feeling about it or opinion about it or, or even, even a, a clue as to what it actually is. And yet, these experiences are present in your experience. So... These are the areas that, uh, that I recommend are the most fruitful to explore and to play with. You can go to these kinds of neutral, relatively ephemeral portions of your experience and relax with them and be with them and let them show you what they are and you'll be tending to see them as they actually are outside the context of what you hold them to be. And then as you get a knack for this, as you acquire a subtlety and a skill at experiencing this kind of openness and this kind of undefined quality, this skill will translate over into the areas in your life where you are used to holding things to be a certain way, holding yourself to be a certain way. And ultimately you'll be able to discover that nothing is the way you have held it to be. Nothing is the way you have thought it to be. And so your reactions to the way you think things are deflate. They, 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 they become ephemeral. They turn out to be, to be, to have no steam, no juice, no importance. Mm -mm. And then we find ourselves in this field of openness, of just open being, spontaneously doing itself that reality actually consists of that life actually consists of we find ourselves here in this apparent situation <clears throat> we always have there's no operator's manual there's no set of directions there's no um little placard that says what to do in case of fire you know, and um, of course we've all been told a lot about what's going on here our parents told us a lot society told us a lot you know, our schools have told us a lot religions tell us a lot science tells us a lot all of these these different um, authorities are explain to us what's going on here. 
but most of it doesn't hold water. Most of it is not very convincing or thorough, and it doesn't really seem to be comprehensive in terms of what our actual situation is. In spiritual traditions, of course, um, we're told a lot. There's all sorts of different spiritual advice that defines our situation in various ways. You know, as a human being, some traditions say you're fundamentally flawed. So your spiritual recourse is to fix yourself, repair yourself. You know, <coughs> self-improvement or or get rid of your afflictive emotions or get rid of your habitual patterns or all of these various things which are somehow garbage in the system and need to be rooted out, need to be uprooted and gotten rid of before we can somehow find ourselves in some condition of wholeness or some condition of, of fulfill, fulfillment. In fact, most spirituality is pretty much, in modern, modern terms, is pretty much synonymous with self-improvement in one form or another. Improve the way you think, improve your emotions, improve your relationships, open your heart, love people more, find peace, all of these various things, which are no doubt laudable and um, possibly a, a, a significant improvement for many of us. But does it really solve the problem? Does it really answer the question, what's going on here? What is this? What fundamentally is happening? What is this about? Well, we're in luck because we have this here openly and nakedly on display to examine, to look into, to inquire as to what exactly it is. And the only thing that can come up to work that can prevent us from looking and seeing what it is, letting it show us what it is, is our preconceptions of what we already think it is. We already think we know what it is. We think we know what's going on here. I think I know who I am. I think I know what my life's about. I think I know what my history is. I think I know what my goals are. I think I know what my problems are, right? All this stuff. But how accurate is it? How true is it? Do I really know what I am? Do I really know anything about this astounding condition, this astounding situation we find ourselves in? But this situation is as it is. It already is as it is. It's here. Light is shining. You know, gravity is, is holding is, is holding pulling everything together. Consciousness is perceiving. The machine is functioning. The machine is whirring away. It's all happening. This is what it happens to look like at the moment. You, you, you're aware, in some sense, of being conscious, right? You're being aware of perceiving. In some way, that, that's, that sort of seems intuitively obvious, right? What is it? We can look at it, look at it and see what is it. Well, it's very mysterious, isn't it? I mean, you look at it and the first thing you notice is, whoa, where is it? You know, it's so obvious, it's so obviously right here. But then you, you, you try and find it, try and lay your hands on it, try and define it in any sense, and it reveals itself as very, very strange. Is that a problem? Does that mean... Is the strangeness an issue? Maybe strangeness is what it is. Wouldn't that be interesting? And so, wow, this world includes this fundamental strangeness, this fundamental weirdness inherently, which is always right here, completely obvious. What is it that's appearing in consciousness? Again, it... it, it it, it's self-evident that there's apparition, but again, when you look for it and try and find it, it becomes very strange because experience has some very peculiar properties. It's constantly morphing. It won't hold still. You look at something and it just keeps unfolding and changing and morphing and, and spinning off into 
other versions, other associations, other aspects of itself. And so we think, yeah, but there's something there that's solid and not changing. It's just my experience of it is changing somehow because I'm fuzzy headed. <laughs> Was that true? What's the evidence? Maybe fuzziness is what we have here. When we're in deep sleep, what do we have? You know, fuzziness is not too bad a description of what the object actually consists of. When we're in dreaming, what do we have? Well, you know, I don't know if fuzziness is necessarily just the right adjective, but it's pretty weird, whatever it is. It's, you know, it's obviously present, right? There's, there's experience present when we dream, isn't there? You know, it's self-evident. Well, there's the dream's there, right? But what is it that's there? How is it there? It's very weird, isn't it? It's very strange. It, 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 it's ghostly. It moves in and out. It's ambiguous. It can be many things at the same time. And we don't even second-guess it when we're dreaming. We take it for granted. Yeah, of course. This is, you know, this is my world. I'm my life. I'm in it. I'm engaged in it. And then we wake up or we go lucid and we go, wow, I was dreaming. Isn't that amazing? But when you're dreaming, you don't know you're dreaming. You're just completely gullible. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, this is happening. I'm here. I'm doing, you know, I'm engaged. I'm living my life. You know, I'm, just, I'm flying. You know, I'm running away from monsters. Cool. You know, it's got to be done. Someone's got to do it. And here we are in this situation. Of course, we all take it for granted. This is normalcy, right? You know, we all had dinner and now we're at a spiritual talk and after a while we'll go home and watch some TV or read a book or, you know, pick a fight with our partner or whatever it is we do. And it's all normal, right? It's all perfectly normal. It's just... But what is it that's actually appearing? How is it appearing? What way is it appearing? What's it appearing to? How is it appearing in consciousness? What is this consciousness that is so weird when we look at it? And what is this that's appearing that we take for granted and seems so normal? And if you look at this, how it appears, it reveals itself as pretty weird too. Constantly morphing, constantly shifting, unfindable. You can't find the final version of anything. A flavor, what does it taste like? So you take a bite of a cookie or something. And, oh, it's, it's obviously got a flavor. You taste it and go, oh, yeah, mm, it tastes good. Mm. But what exactly does it taste like? What exactly? So you go to the taste and it's, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. And you take another bite and it tastes very much the same, but kind of different, too. And, and every experience is constantly different, constantly, subtly unique. Or maybe not so subtly. Has anyone here ever experienced exactly the same thing twice? Can't be done. You've never what you're seeing in your field of vision now. You have never seen before. Not one tiny pixel of it. It's never happened. And now it's already different. It's changed. You're seeing something different. You know, and and it's gone forever now. That instant, a moment ago, never going to happen again. You're never going to see what you just saw then. You're never going to think what you were thinking then. You're never going to feel the way you were feeling then. <coughs> I mean, oh yeah, it's normal, of course. It's, you know, it's experience, it's life. If we can approach, if you can approach your experience open-endedly without expectation, without preconceptions, let go of your notions and your beliefs and your ideas about what it is and what's happening, and experience your experience as it actually is in the instant, see what it is that is here, what here is, what now is, which is doable, because here it is, right? Here it is. We can look at this, we can examine this, we can be with this and let it show us what it is. What it will show you that it is, is very surprising. It's very strange, it's very peculiar. 
with reference to typical human notions about what it is. And you are this most intimately, most specifically. You're here. This is real. This consciousness that's experienced in this moment is you. This energy pattern, this evanescent energy pattern which is constantly fluctuating through your consciousness is you. What is it? There is a power, there is a force, there is a profound motive that is in operation here, that is in action here, that is doing all this. <clears throat> there are many names for this throughout history and in different traditions, the will of God, the flow of prana, um, <clears throat> the Big Bang. Thanks to George Lucas, we have the force. <laughs> um, in Kashmir Shaivism, we have Spanda, the primal urge, the primal divine creative force that is inherent in Shakti. <clears throat> now, all these sound very grand and wonderful. <clears throat> But the, the important point, the interesting point, is that what all of these terms refer to is most intimate. It is happening right here. It is what is doing your every action. It is doing everything in your experience. It is doing the world. It is doing your thoughts. It is doing your metabolism. It is doing your evolution. It is doing your life. It will do your death. It is doing all of this spontaneously and inherently. My favorite term for this is one that I coined or stole from somebody, I don't know which, which is, I call it the inherent intelligence. There is an intelligence, a, a functional structurality, a structural functionality, that's better, <laughs> that is actually built into everything that is that everything is made of it's it's what constitutes the laws of physics it's why atoms work the way they do so perfectly why chemistry works why metabolism works why dna works why consciousness works why experience works why astrophysics works why the stars and the galaxies behave as they do this astounding inconceivable functionality and this is not an abstract principle. It is absolutely right here, right now, completely present, completely accessible. In fact, you can't possibly not access it. You can't possibly turn it off. <laughs> but noticing this puts a different slant on things, discovering that in actual fact, we are not responsible. We are not doing our lives. Our lives are being done. Another word for this is the life force. This is a nice sort of a um, secular term that kind of kind of a squishy term, but it's it's apropos. It, it really it, it, it talks about what this actually is. This this life force that is responsible for your being, for your for your health, for your the fact that you're here now, everything, everything. And this force is, it's like, the, it's like the backbone of the universe. It's like the, the central column, the central um, array of reality itself. And it is profoundly creative and profoundly effective. <clears throat> and it is all actions, all events, all experiences are imbued with this creativity with this profound and integral functionality. There, so in this, this is the sense in which there are no accidents. Everything that happens is a direct outgrowth of this ongoing functionality of this uh, incredible system that you consist of. <clears throat> in 
in terms of spirituality, discovering and noticing and tuning into this force is of the essence. Discovering that there is this primal intelligence, this primal meaningfulness, this primal purity that is behind everything and that and not behind everything in some abstract sense or some grandiose metaphysical sense, but behind everything right here. Right here. And this force, this Shakti, is absolutely sacred, absolutely primal, absolutely integral to the very, very core of being, the very core of things. And when we notice this, we notice that our life is profoundly meaningful, profoundly integral to the very fabric of reality. And our you know, so-called spiritual unfoldment or spiritual development is one with this primal creativity, this primal expansion of the meaningfulness of reality itself. <clears throat> when we notice the objective pole of our experience, notice the objects and the way experience shows up, this amazing radiant presence that shows up, the, the, the energy, the light that shows up as our dreams, as our thoughts, as our experience of the so-called objective world, this amazing presence that spontaneously appears, all of this presence is a direct revelation of this primal force, of this primal radiance that is doing all things and is behind all things and is actually embedded in and, in, and embodied by all things. So we have immediate access to this, we have immediate experience of this in this very presence, in this very experience that you are experiencing right now, this is the primal force, this is the divine force, the divine purity, manifesting itself um, as your experience. What spirituality is, is often widely uh, uh, misunderstood these days. <clears throat> Spirituality is often confused with self-improvement, with establishing psychological health, with solving emotional problems. Um, it's sort of approached as the ultimate therapy, or in, in any way, in the hope in the hope of finding the ultimate therapy. <clears throat> but this is not what spirituality actually is. <clears throat> True spirituality is about discovering what this is, what's going on here. Um, and not changing it in any way, not improving it, just discovering what it is. And it turns out that that discovery, what it is, we also discover what we are. We discover what's happening here, how it happens. And this is the ultimate answer to all and any questions. And it, it, it so happens that it brings relief, it brings um, fulfillment, it brings, uh, well, I could say some very grandiose things, it brings uh, knowledge of eternal being, the knowledge of the non-existence of space and time, the knowledge of your identity with the Absolute. All of which sounds very grandiose, but it happens to be the simple fact, and it is discoverable. <clears throat> now, since what is happening here is happening here, it seems that it ought to be fairly easy, you would think, to notice that, to discover what this is. <clears throat> but there is uh, an incredible amount of misinformation floating around in various archaic religions and philosophies and human interpretations about what's going on that are passed on pretty mindlessly from one person to another. As human beings, we're hampered largely by two factors. <clears throat> Number one, we're lazy. We don't want to bother to have to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> so if 
if you know it's much easier to go out like a smorgasbord and pick a convenient spiritual philosophy that's out there than than invent your own from scratch or discover your own from scratch. And the other limiting factor is we're tribal. We have a very profound inherent inclination to imitate each other. So if you're in a group of people and they're all seem to be more or less behaving and adhering to a certain way of approaching things, you're going to probably feel a strong unconscious inclination to mimic them, to do the same thing they're doing. And these two factors um, are major contributors to this almost universal misunderstanding of the simple event that's going on here. <clears throat> but of course the good news is that it is possible to discover what this is. It is possible to discover what you are. And the place to look is right here. It's, it's nakedly revealed. It's plain to see what it is. And the main hampering influence is our preconceptions, usually held unconsciously, so they aren't particularly accessible, that we think we already know what this is. We already think we know what's going on. We already think we know what we are. And as a result, we, we don't really get off our butts to move very far from those established certainties as we hold them to be. Could you put the level down on this mic a bit? <clears throat> <clears throat> but if we can be with this outside of the context, let go of our preconceptions a little bit, if we can be with this outside of the context of those preconceptions, of those expectations, of the you know, assured statements of philosophies and religions as to what's going on here, and can just nakedly investigate this, we can discover what this is, because it's not hidden. <clears throat> it happens that what this is cannot be put into human concepts. It cannot be accurately addressed in words. So... Uh, this is another big confusing factor in terms of trying to interpret all these philosophies and religions and spiritual paths because there is a 100% inaccuracy. Anything that anyone has ever said about reality is untrue. So this, of course, is a, uh, is a major uh, confusing factor in trying to read the scriptures or read the, you know, read into... Uh, philosophies and spiritual paths and expect them to accurately be telling it like it is. <clears throat> but if we can be with this without preconceptions, non-verbally, very directly, just be with this experience and let it show us what it is, we will discover what it is, we will discover what we are, and we will discover what's going on here. And that very, very simple fact is the great goal of spirituality. This is real, spiritual realization. This is enlightenment. This is liberation. This simple fact of just seeing this as it is and not piling it with extra imaginary interpretations, just that simple event is the great goal, the great reward, the great achievement in all of the spiritual traditions. <clears throat> When we look at this, what do we notice? Well, there seems to be some kind of a consciousness, a power of perception. Experience, experience is experienced. So there's, this is interesting. So what, what is that? How does this happen? And experience is, shows up as some, something experienced. There is some display of qualities. There is some display of, of something that experience consists of. So what is that? How, where does that come from? What's it made of? 
How does it appear? How does it disappear? How is it perceived? Where is it perceived? Where does it exist? When does it exist? These very, very fundamental questions turn out to be extremely profound. And we can look at them very directly because it's happening right here. Right now, your experience is showing up. Right, right now, your experience is appearing. How is that happening? Just look at it. How is it appearing? You know, your field of vision is full of all of this character. How is it appearing? You know, how is it changing? How is it unstable? How does it disappear? How do past character? How do past configurations of appearance? How are they gone forever, completely? You know, where have they gone to? Where do they come from? How do they come? I mean, all these questions obviously don't have a literal, simplistic answer, and certainly don't have a verbal or conceptual answer, but they're a good jumping off point to look at this, to investigate what is actually happening here. What is this event? How is it happening? Is it what I've been told it is? Is it what people think it is? What is time? Time is right here. This is time, right? This is now. You can't find time anywhere other than here, so this is a good place to look at it. What is time? Well, you know, can you find the present? Can you find the past? Can you find the future? How do they work? How does the, what's the relationship between the supposed past and the supposed present? What's the relationship between the present and the future? Right here, not as abstract concepts or as thoughts or as you know, philosophies, but just looking at the actual event. How, how is time happening here? in your experience, how is it happening? All these sorts of questions. And again, you're not going to get a simplistic verbal answer. You're not going to look at it and say, ah, oh, I see what it is, time is blah, 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 period. And yet, this question prompts an investigation, prompts a looking, prompts a being with this astounding phenomena and Simply by that action, it may show you what it is. <clears throat> um, we have a remote microphone we use if you'd like to um, have a discussion. Um, we don't really need uh, microphones and speakers in this little gathering, but there are people online perhaps listening, following along, and that way they'll be able to hear what you have to say. So if you'd like to talk about anything, if you'd just put your hand up, then the mic will be passed to you. <coughs> Is it on? <clears throat> Is it on? So, <clears throat> Peter, I had a question about, um, well, well no, noticing, I mean, it, it, it seems like it's, it's sort of like peeling an, an onion. Uh, like, let's say I, just a minute ago, I, I was <clears throat> thinking about qu uh, quiet or how quiet oh. it seemed today. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and that started with the concept and then, um, then after a while, I mean, it's so part of noticing is just not, is, 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 is peeling away identification or, you know, your preconception mm -hmm. of, of the concept. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then things get really murky. I mean, um, and so, I mean, if I peel the onion away enough, um, there's just, it's, there's something but I, I couldn't, uh, well, I mean, there's something. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, because, I, well, well it, if I peel it away enough, I mean, this, the something is just vast and large. Yes. But let's say, just say, just trying to get, get rid of the concept of non-activity or quiet and then just sort of focusing on that as... Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. 
typically, you know, not, not, not identifying with it, but just seeing what it is. Yeah. Typically, in this inquiry, we start, we start off with a fairly simple question or approach or something we think we're looking at, and the mind will supply answers or, or points of investigation that it thinks are appropriate. But then as we are with our experience, these, these expectations of what we're looking at or what we hope to find reveal themselves as hopelessly inadequate, hopelessly simplistic. And we discover our experience is subtle, our experience is, is um, a, uh, ambiguous, it is indeterminate, it is, it is um, not of a character that resolves itself clearly into this or that. And this is very interesting, that it, it, it actually is like that, it's findably like that. When you look for anything, you don't, it doesn't converge on a simple condition and, oh, now I got it, I looked for it and I found it. Right. You look for it and you find what there is to find, but what you find is a whole category of something, of event, of being, that, is, that has very interesting properties. It has these properties of indeterminacy and unresolvability and you know, paradoxical quality, uh, which, again, Make make our initial pre presumptions as we look as we start this inquiry laughable, um, but this is not a failure of investigation. On the contrary, this is a success in investigation because we discovered that what this is has very very interesting inherent properties. It does not. It tends to be divergent. It doesn't tend to be convergent. If it was convergent, if you looked for something, the closer the more you looked, the closer you would get on what it is. And the nature of reality is that as you look at it, the closer you look, the more it seems to spread out and smear and, and alternative aspects of it present itself, which is very interesting. And at first, you know, when we're approaching this naively, more naively, we think of this as, oh, a failure, I'm not looking right, I'm getting distracted, I'm getting confused. But as we develop more experience and more sophistication, more subtlety in this, in this inquiry, in this noticing, we discover that, no, this is, this is actually what it is. This is what it's like. Very interesting. This is a whole, a whole different kettle of fish. It's a whole different character of event than I expected at all. And then we find this amazing, well, we can't say. But it's something. It's not nothing. Right. That, that's, it's not that's, nothing. That's the sense that I, that I get. That, yeah. That... Well, just by just by the fact of noticing, it's sort of like jumping into a swimming pool, or a, in, you know, just sort of swimming. Yeah. But there's something underneath. Yeah, there's something there. But <laughs> that's, that's, and basically, the goal is to develop enough of a mature understanding of it, enough of a hands-off attitude, so you aren't. So you outgrow the resistance, outgrow the tendency to resolve it as this or that and let it be what it is, and then you can find what it is, but it won't be a simple what. It won't be, a, oh yeah, it's this or that. It's, it's, it's what it is. It's specifically and exactly what it is, but what that is has some astounding characteristics which cannot be verbalized, which cannot be conceptualized, which in terms of human logic are absolute gibberish. And yet, this is what it is. So there is a sense at some point when you, that's what you say, this is what it is? Or yeah, you, 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 this is sense. findable. You can find what this is, but it's not what you expect, and it's not anything that can be said, and it's not anything that makes any sense whatsoever in terms of any human logical system. Um, for if those of you that are new, noticing is a euphemism for this process of looking at what is happening here, noticing what's happening, noticing what this is, noticing what the event is. And any point of ingress, anything whatsoever in your experience can be a starting off point for noticing. You can look at anything. You can look at how you're seeing. You can look for a particular idea that you have, look for you know, calmness, you know, look at a consciousness, look for intelligence, look at what a light is, look at the sun, look at a blade of grass, listen to a sound. doesn't matter where you, what your starting point is. If you are noticing what it is, you will very rapidly 
transcend your expectations and move into this being with your experience very directly and it will start to show you what it is. But again, what you find will be confusing at first perhaps because it does not conform to anything that is logical, anything that is simple, anything that is graspable or, or definable or specifiable in terms of ideas or words. <clears throat> But it's not its fault. It's our, it's human logic that's in error, not it. <laughs> it's the simplicity of our of our of our human conceptual systems and our human semantic systems that are at fault, not reality. Here's a good jumping off point for noticing. Presence. Presence. Your experience is obviously present. It's clearly and obviously present. What is it? What is presence? How is it present? What, what is this presence? It's, it's completely obvious. This presence is is nakedly obvious, and yet what exactly is it? I think that clarity is something that is very easy to misunderstand. I think, I think it's easy to have an erroneous idea that a mental clarity that we can somehow contrive, that we can somehow find or create or maintain um, is an advantage in spirituality and correspondingly when we lose this mental clarity or we find ourselves lapsing into some kind of unclarity or confusion that this is a problem. In actual fact this is a misunderstanding. The, the, the actual clarity, the spiritually powerful clarity is the inherent clarity which cannot be strengthened, it cannot be increased, it cannot be lost. Um, it is the clarity of your very experience. The way that you self-evidently are aware that you are experiencing right now. Now what you're experiencing may be that you have a fever and you're drunk and you're dizzy and you just took acid and it's coming on and you're just whoo! But all of that unclarity and confusion is occurring in a basic space of clarity or you would not know it was happening. The fact that you know it's happening means it is occurring in clarity, in unobscured awareness that is primal, that is, in, that is inherent, that does not increase, it does not decrease, it cannot be started, it cannot be stopped. It is it is the, the basic fundamental awareness whereby you know that you are, you know that the present moment exists. And then what happens to be existing in the present moment can be anything, right? Of course, we, you know, it can be sleep, it can be awake, it can be joy, it can be horror, it can be extreme pain, it can be total confusion and disorientation. But all of these conditions occur within perfect clarity or you wouldn't know they were happening. You would not have the experience. So this is not an abstract thing. It's a, it's a supremely concrete thing. Right now, your experience is appearing clearly. And even if you're confused, that confusion is appearing in clarity, a background clarity, the clarity of, called the clarity of the being of the present moment. Now, this clarity is, is very important. It's profoundly important. It's profoundly powerful. It is the clarity um, whereby realization occurs. It is the clarity that is the basic clarity, the basic awareness of reality itself. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism they call this clarity rigpa, which is a term that has an enormous amount of mysticism and secrecy and excitement around it in Dzogchen and various other traditions. But it's really a very simple thing that everyone has complete awareness of 24-7 
It's just this simple clarity, this simple clear space that everything appears in. That's all. And what appears can be anything. It's not about what appears. It's not about what this looks like. It's not about how you would characterize your experience of, oh, I'm clear, oh, I'm happy, oh, I'm sad, oh, I'm confused, oh, I'm really just sharp on the beam. It's not about that. It's about that anything's appearing at all. That's where the action is. That's where the power is. That's where reality lies. <clears throat> the very essence, the very nature of spirituality is what this is, what you are. Not about improving it, not about um, adjusting it, not about finding techniques to, you know, to deal with your problems and all that. Although all that's fine, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But that's not really what actual spirituality is. True spirituality is what this is, that this is, and that you are this. You are what this is. You are not a separate being. You are not a, a uh, you know, a, a, a small primate running around in, a, in an infinite universe. You are what this is, and what this is is astounding, is unimaginable, and yet is nakedly revealed right here. It's not secret. You know, although astoundingly, even though it's omnipresent, people don't seem to notice it. <laughs> we're, because we're an excitable lot. <laughs> we get caught up in, caught up in the sound and fury. <clears throat> So, the point is, this appears, this is appearing right now, this is appearing, isn't it? And it's still appearing, and it's still appearing, and it's always appearing, right? It's never looked exactly the way it looks right now before. It's never sounded exactly the way it sounds right now before. It's never felt exactly the way it feels right now before. And now it's already gone in something else. And it will never be this exactly like this again. And yet what it is, is always exactly the same. What it is, this miraculously appearing, spontaneously occurring, inherent clarity that you can't get rid of, you can't stop it, there's no off switch this clarity of beingness, this clarity of that this is, whatever it looks like, it is. And this is in clarity, it is as radiance. It's always radiance appearing in clarity. Now radiance may look like a bunch of people sitting around an old building in Berkeley. Radiance may look like, you know, hearing a, uh, an old soundtrack through a garbled PA system. Radiance may look like deep sleep. Radiance may look like being at work and being pissed off at your boss. Radiance can look like anything, but what is appearing is made of a spontaneously occurring radiance. Very mysterious. Why does what you're seeing look exactly like it does at this moment? Why does this air pot look exactly like it does? What force is putting it there? What force is making it be exactly what it is? What force is making my hand be exactly what it is? What force is making my hand look different than the ear pot? What force is making you see them? It's effortless. You don't need to like, you don't need to, oh, let me, let me try and see the hand, let me try. They're just right here. You can't stop it. It's just effortless. This effortless apparition, this effortless apparition of all this field of vast, infinitely differentiated radiance appearing in this effortless, miraculous, weird, inconceivable field of sentient clarity. You know, it's always the case. It's always true. And it can look like anything. And it may seem simple. You know, it certainly seems very obvious once you notice it. But this is actually what all the fuss is about. This is actually what all these books have been written about. This is actually what all of these teachings 
have been about all these secret teachings and you know um, you know lifetime long spiritual paths and all this and that are really about just this miraculous presence right here not as an abstract thing not like in capital letters the presence you know just this is here self-evidently and but the point is it's not a little thing it's not slight it's not boring it's not graspable it is literally miraculous this that disappears it you know and this is hard to deal with because it's normal. Well, of course this is, you know, sure it is. It was this morning, it's going to be tonight, it's going to be when I go to bed, it's going to be on my deathbed, it's going to be this is. Yeah, of course, duh. You know, it's like how boring. But it's not boring. If you really look closely at what this is, how is this appearing? Where is this clarity happening? Where is it? I mean, it's here, but what does that mean? Where is it? How does it work? What's doing it? How does this never-ending display of weird, inconceivable, radiant patterns keep showing up in it. You know, how does this happen? How does all of this Baroque and insane interpretations that show up in our mentality spontaneously happen? Where does it come from? What's doing it? What force is putting that there? What force is putting our emotional reactivity and our emotional getting all caught up in all the stories and narrations and our interpretations of what we think this patterning is, you know? Oh, so-and-so said this to me. God, a bitch, you know? How could she do that? I hate her. You know? It, it, all of this happens effortlessly, spontaneously. You know, we don't try to do this. We don't need to go out of our way to make this happen. It's just like, bang, it's called life. You know, it, it, just, it just, here it is. You know, you wake up and there it is. But, but, it, but it's not a little thing. The, and there it is, it's not a diminishment. It's not minimizing it. Here it is. You know, this is profound. This is mind-boggling. This is inconceivable. Just this, just this simple presence here, this miraculous presence. Um, can you notice it? Can you notice that this is actually here and it's inconceivable. I mean, how can this be here? How can being be here? What's doing it? <clears throat> but simply feeling this, simply being with this, noticing how astounding this is, and just, just sitting with it nakedly, not with letting go of your ordinary ideas about what this is, sitting with this presence nakedly, it will show you, it will reveal to you what it is, very directly, non-conceptually, in completely non-linear, completely astounding, profound revelations of what this is, what you are, what's going on here. This is knowable. This is realizable. This is not some you know, abstract thing that we need to leave to physicists so we can go about our business and make money and get popular. This is about, this is, this is totally available. It's right here, right now, and we can be with it, we can look at it, and it will show us what it is. It will teach us what it is if we just let it, if we're just with it in, in an openness and an appreciation of how astounding it is. You know, typically we don't. Typically we minimize it. We're like, oh, of course it is. You know, what's going on? What's on TV today? You know, what, what do I have to do today? What's on my shopping list? You know, and we completely gloss over the miracle and go right into the soap opera. <clears throat> but we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because it turns out that where the action is, where the juice is, where the real reward is, is actually in, the, in the, just the fundamental fact, just this threshold of life that we have to cross to go into any event, right? Just this being right here, we have to cross this to go into our soap opera, to go into our, you know, our excitement and the things we love and the things we hate and the things we hope for. We have to cross this simple, present, obvious being and we devalue it, we don't appreciate it. But just, just instead of crossing it, just sometimes if you feel like it, just sort of just sit with this presence and this is interesting. This is interesting. What is it? 
You won't get an answer, but nonetheless it will show you. It will deepen. It will profoundly communicate itself to you. And it, it, in, this, in so doing, it communicates yourself to you. It communicates the Absolute to you. It communicates infinity to you. It actually communicates divinity to you. Because it is all these things. All of those things refer to nothing other than this simple presence right here. Well, there's a nice fact about true spirituality. And that is that there's only one thing you need to know. There's only one fact you need to understand, you need to assimilate, you need to come to grips with. <coughs> and this fact is that this is not what you think it is. That's the important fact. No, no aspect of it is what you think it is, what you have ever thought it is. The world is not what you think it is. You are not what you think you are. Sight is not what you think it is. Thought is not what you think it is. People, other people are not what you think they are. The way this works is not what you think it is. Space is not what you think it is. Time is not what you think it is. So this, it's a very simple, I mean, when you start enumerating it like that, it begins to sound complicated, but it's much, much, much simpler than that. What this is, is other than and completely beyond what you think it is. Any way you can hold it to be, no matter how elaborate and sophisticated, will not suffice in being able to capture what this actually is. <coughs> now, this fact turns out to be extremely powerful because it also defines the nature of spiritual practice. So, the entire theory and practice of spirituality is to get the idea that nothing is what you think it is and then simply sit with your experience in that context. Be with this without holding it to be anything in particular. And this is true meditation, this is true inquiry. And being with this without holding it to be anything in particular, this will show you what it is gradually, it will reveal itself. You will come to see what this is, you will come to see what you are, all very organically, inherently and intrinsically, just by the very nature of your experience. In other words, your experience will show you what it is. And of course, the cardinal fact being, it's not what you have ever th always thought it to be. It's not what you can possibly think it to be. So simply, simply, you know, hearing that fact, um, analyzing it, coming to grips with it, coming to understand the truth of it, and then assimilating this fact um, within your experience, to be with your experience in, in, in unknowing, to be with your experience in openness, in mystery, in, well, you know, here this is and I don't know what it is. That alone is sufficient. Just remain in that um, stance, so to speak, with regard to your experience and be open with it, be unknowing with it and over time, gradually, organically, very directly, it will show you what it is. It will reveal itself to you. It will communicate its nuance to you. <clears throat> and even though what this is turns out to be inconceivable, you are capable of assimilating and understanding this because you also are inconceivable. What you are is vastly beyond what you may think yourself to be. What this is is vastly beyond what you may think it to be. And so you have inherently the ability, the, the hyper-intelligence to approach and understand what this is very directly because you are much more than you think yourself to be. You can meet this where it is because you are it. You are this mystery. You are this astoundingness that this here, your, this, ex this present experience actually consists of. And so again, the, the key to it all is simply realizing that you don't really know what it is and letting go of 
this habit we have of holding it to be a certain way, holding ourselves to be a certain way, having a sense that our definitions of things are more or less true or more or less accurate or even accurate at all. <clears throat> In actual fact, our ideas are all completely wrong, entirely wrong. We don't know what anything is. We, we can't even scratch the surface on what anything is. And when we get this through our thick heads, when we get this through our sloppy karma, then we can be capable of sitting with this in openness, in mystery, in surprise, in spontaneity. And in that condition, in that condition alone, this will show you what it is. It will, it will teach itself to you. It will, reveal, it will reveal itself to you. It will display its nuance, which it always has been doing. But we are blocked from noticing that by our ideas that we think we already know what it is. <clears throat> so this is actually a very, uh, this is great news. This is good luck. There's only one thing you need to know. All the spirituality, all of this, you know, philosophies and, and, and uh, 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 schools and religions. And there's just one fact you need to know. And, and that fact is not just, not just, the, the explanation of your state of affairs, but it is also the, the secret to spiritual practice. Spiritual practice is simply resting in that fact, simply resting in not knowing, simply resting in not holding your experience to be anything in particular, and that alone is sufficient. <clears throat> There's only one genuine spiritual problem and that is the inability to distinguish between imagination and reality. <clears throat> Typically, we think things are real, we think conditions exist in a certain way that we hold them to be, when in actual fact, these ways that we hold them to be are purely imaginary. And so we become confused. We think, no, this is this. This, this is how things are supposed to be. This is what things are. And we're wrong. Because reality, it happens, cannot be said. It cannot be described. It cannot be defined. So a simple indicator is, <clears throat> anytime you think you know what any condition or thing or entity is to any degree whatsoever, that is imagination. That is imaginary. That is not real. <clears throat> now it becomes very subtle and paradoxical because of course imagination is real. So imagination isn't imaginary. <clears throat> No, 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 we're leaving the music on. It's part, the disorientation is part of the presentation. Well, the disorientation is part of the, of the presentation. It'll force you to focus and follow my words with intent. Or fail miserably and space out, and that's cool too. <clears throat> Imagination is real. But it's not imagination, it's not imaginary. Imagination is something we think we know what it is. Imagination is X, Y, Z. Imagination is, define imagination. It is, you know, some sentence, some definition of what imagination is. It isn't. Imagination exists in the same sense that thought exists, in the same sense that vision exists. But vision isn't vision. No one knows what vision is. Thought isn't thought. No one knows what thought is. Imagination isn't imagination. No one knows what imagination is. It's a mysterious property of reality that it has this strange mode we might call functionality of generating versions of things. <clears throat> and, and as I said, our, the sole spiritual problem boils down to inability to distinguish between what's imaginary 
and what is actual. Nothing exists that is not actual. Nothing exists that is not real. Reality alone exists. Everything that exists is real. <coughs> right? This is real. What is it? Does anyone know what this is? It's a table. Okay, it's a table. What's a table? <laughs> okay, so right away you're in imagination because you're positing the existence of ground, you're positing the existence of legs, you're positing the existence of above, a spatial relationship, which implies that there is space, and probably implies that it exists in time as well, and all of these are, are imaginary fabrications. It's not that they don't exist, but they are not what we hold them to be. <clears throat> the same with you. You may think you're a person. What is a person? Well, you know, whatever you come up with as an answer to that question is imaginary. A person is infinite, fathomless, bottomless mystery. Just like what this is, is infinite, fathomless, bottomless mystery. That's all we got. That's all that actually exists. That's all that is findable. <laughs> and any time we think we're finding something, more specific and more explicit than that, we are imagining it. We are creating the notion in our mind. We are creating an oversimplified version of what we're holding it to be, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with imagining. Imagination is great fun. The only problem becomes when we hold that the way we're imagining things to be, they actually are. If I thought this actually was a table, then I just have a world of pain open to me. It's like, oh my God, it's a table. What do I do about that? Here I am in this world with this table. What do I do with it? Where do I put it? You know, How, you know, what's it cost? I mean, all of these implications, all of a sudden they're there. Whereas when it's bottomless, fathomless, infinite mystery, what do I have to do anything with it? Hmm? There's no visual limitation whatsoever. It's a concept. Your vision is not limited. You are seeing infinity right now can you find any edges to this? I mean, how big is it? How small is it? You know, how, how many different ways is this perceivable? You know, can you get to the bottom of what it is through perceived perception? You can't. You cannot. And yet, if, we, if you make that jump to, oh yeah, it's a table, I know what it is, and check it off, and okay, now I know everything I want to know about it, move on to the next thing. You, are, you have shut the door on the reality of infinite presence, which is what this actually is, not, is, not intellectually, not as a notion, that's what this actually is. That's what you actually are. That's what your experience actually is. You can't find anything else whatsoever. It cannot be found. And when you think you are finding anything else, you're conjuring it into existence in your imagination, and it does not actually exist. <clears throat> What's happening right here, right now, is what it's all about, is what the, all the fuss is about. All, in all religions, all gods, all symbols of divine qualities, all refer to nothing other than this event that's happening right here, right now. So you can become an, a scholar, become expert at the iconography of the various Hindu gods or the Tibetan gods and every symbol that's depicted on every god and every portion of their myth all refers to particular qualities of divinity. And every single one of those qualities can be found nowhere other than right here, right now. <clears throat> the same thing applies to um, all the great and of course even the not so great human philosophies, spiritual philosophies, scientific philosophies. All are concerned with this event right here, this fact right here. <clears throat> now the typical pattern for most people who are interested in spirituality is to delve into these 
various systems to delve into these religions and these philosophies and these practices that have all sorts of elaborations and terminologies and they may have um, you know elaborate symbolisms you have to learn elaborate behaviors you have to learn all of which refer to nothing other than this event right here so in effect approaching this in that way consists of departing from this into all these elaborate systems of symbolism as a supposed strategy to approach this which has been right here all along or which is where you started from <clears throat> um, my suggestion is why not just be with this if this is what all the fuss is about if this is the finish line of spirituality, if this is reality itself, why not simply be with this and let it show you what it is? <clears throat> A major challenge to this is the extent to which we are all so thoroughly steeped in human semantic systems and human logic and the logic that is implicit in our language and so we approach this with this powerful set of preconceptions of oh it must be a thing or include things because there's nouns it must be an action or include action because there's verbs it must have qualities because there's adverbs and adjectives and the nouns that are qualitative and all of this. So we have, we have a powerful set of preconceptions, a powerful bias of what we expect to find here when we investigate it, what we expect to see. <laughs> and in terms of the difficulty of our task, um, the unfortunate fact is that what is to be found here in no way corresponds even in the slightest degree to anything whatsoever that is implied by human semantic systems, by the structure of our language, by human logic. <clears throat> so um, this can be a big challenge. We need to free ourselves or somehow set aside our accumulated bias and our 40, 50, 30, 60, however many years of, of um, indoctrination in human logic in order to be able to approach this as it is. We have a big advantage. We have an, an asset. We have a point of entry, which is that what we are is what this is. So we already have very direct experience at a level which is much more primal than these abstract levels implied by human logic and human semantic systems. <clears throat> we are, we are, and that is an irrational, self-evident fact that in no way corresponds to logic, that in no way corresponds to semantic structure <laughs> that is exactly as it is so we already have our foot in the door we already have a point of contact with this that we are investigating <clears throat> which is a wonderful advantage if we have the good fortune or luck to be able to take advantage of it to be able to notice the profound power of this fact that you already are, you exist, and this existence, this very being is not logical, it is not explainable, it is not justifiable, it is a simple, naked, undeniable, self-evident fact, and this is a powerful fact. <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> so this simple being, this simple state of affairs, 
that actually obtains right here, right now, that is completely in full effect, <clears throat> that you are completely a, already a participant in, you already are in the same way that this is, so that is the powerful point in spirituality. That is the powerful asset that we have to work with, that we are, this is. And simply being with that, being with this self-evident, nakedly revealed fact, <clears throat> it reveals spontaneously what it is, because it is its nature to unfold itself. It is its nature to spin off implications. It is its nature to deepen. Aspects of what it consists of are a profound knowingness, a profound intelligence, a profound, um, uh, let's call it uh, uh, impulse to connect with itself. So it's it wants what you want. If you want to get to know this, it wants to get to know itself too. So you are working with, you're going with the stream, you're working with the inherent tendency that is already present in the very being of this present moment. What we call the passage of time or the unfoldment of time is nothing other than this exploring itself. So us exploring ourselves and exploring this is simply merging with that already occurring action, that already occurring stream of event, <clears throat> and not holding ourselves apart from it in our imagination, not holding ourselves as individual, as personal, as separate, as having our own agenda. When our agenda becomes its agenda, then its power, its authority, what's doing all this, becomes our authority, becomes our energizer becomes our, um, our, uh, uh, the source of our action. So this, be, this is a very powerful position to be in. And I recommend it. <laughs> in actual fact, this right here is the presence of absolute, unlimited, infinite divinity. That sounds pretty grand. <clears throat> and it is. It's, it's grander than those words make it sound. The remarkable thing is, if that is the case, which it happens to be, how is it that we can turn this experience into a boring, mundane existence full of pettiness and um, boredom and suffering and small goals and mediocre achievements and indeterminacy. <clears throat> and more to the point, how do we go about discovering what this actually is? <clears throat> it happens to be that. It happens to be inconceivable radiance you know I mean it's it's absolutely it's it's literally beyond words what this is it's the astoundingness and not in some lofty metaphysical philosophical sense but literally and actually this actual presence of your very experience right now is the presence of inconceivable infinity I mean you know what, what does that mean well that's the point. We can't, we can't say what it means. We can't grasp what it means. But it is absolute astoundingness what this is. And the fact is, we can become aware of what this is. We can learn to see what this is as it is. We can learn to appreciate what this is. <clears throat> and needless to say, the quality of experience is drastically transformed 
as a result of this discovery, as a result of beginning, even beginning to notice what this is. Um, <clears throat> the quality of our experience, the quality of our <clears throat> of our fulfillment, of our entertainment, of our elucidation, of our um, well, you know, any positive quality you can you can imagine is off the charts in terms of noticing what this actually is. <clears throat> now, the the uh, the beginning, the first step of noticing what this is, is letting go of what you think it is, because the biggest cork in the bottle, the biggest logjam that keeps us from starting to investigate what this is, is we think we already know. We think we already know what this is. This is the world, it's Berkeley, and it's, you know, the, you know this, this pathetic human culture we live in and our, and our absurd geopolitical situation and humanity on the brink of self-destruction and people wandering around chasing these, these petty egotistic goals and, and money and all this stuff. You know, we think that's what it is. You know, we sort of think we know that. Or, you know, we may, many of us do. <clears throat> And since we think we know, in whatever sense we do, even if it doesn't obviously conform to that particular narrative, since we think we know what it is, we stop there. We aren't looking anymore. We aren't curious. We won't even entertain the possibility. And if someone says it might be different, we think, oh, that's really interesting. Wouldn't that be nice? Or they're a crackpot or, or you know, whatever. It's it's well, that's a that's a fascinating idea, but but it's not but it's not real because what's real is you know what I already know I know what the world is, and we tend to have this deep seated unconscious, you know unquestioned take on things take on what we are who we are what this is what this is about what's possible what's impossible, and. This largely unconscious worldview that we tend to hold, you know, through no fault of our own, it's just a, a, it's accreted over the, the accidents of our life and the, the crazy indoctrinations we've been exposed to culturally and so on and so forth. It prevents us from looking further, prevents us from, from actually questioning, from looking at this with fresh eyes because we're jaded, we already know what it is. And, the idea, and, and it's so easy to split off into fantasy of, oh, wouldn't it be nice, you know? And the lion's share of, of modern spirituality consists of exactly that. It's this wonderful fantasy of, oh, wouldn't it be nice if this was, you know, heaven realm, and if these were angels, you know, and we could contact them and channel them and, you know, all of this. That's a, that's a lovely fantasy, you know? It's, it's lovely, who wouldn't, who wouldn't be you know, who wouldn't, who, whose heart wouldn't it warm to entertain a notion like that. But unfortunately it is a fantasy, and equally unfortunately the people who entertain those fantasies basically know it's a fantasy and don't take it very seriously, and it becomes a, just a lifestyle accoutrement of decorating your house with angels instead of decorating your house with, you know, modern art or whatever. <clears throat> But the fact remains that there's something very, very, very mysterious going on here. Consciousness is some weird shit. It is very slippery, very strange, very bizarre. And there's the sort of modern common sense view that, it, well, consciousness is kind of a, you know, it's a... It's an accidental spin-off of biochemistry, you know, these, you get these really complicated chemical reactions in your brain and they have these electrical components and it spins off and somehow like consciousness is sort of somewhere in the sauce, you know, really, is that so? <laughs> so consciousness is a byproduct of the machine, you know, and the machine is just accidentally happens to exist, you know, these, these complex chemicals accidentally happened to come together in the ocean a few billion years ago and they happened to accidentally combine in, in this way and that way and it sort of cascades along and here we have this inconceivably intricate 
device, this machinery, right? And it just sort of, you know, it just sort of happens, you know. <laughs> there's no in, 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 intelligence involved in that. There's no, like, there's no principle of organization involved in that. It's just sort of, well, you know, it just sort of happened. And then, and then these chemicals happen to get together in your brain, and there happens to be this, oh, wow, you know, this little, little spark, and all of a sudden there's consciousness. Interesting. <laughs> you know? And <clears throat> so just to begin to notice how mysterious what is actually going on here is, is the beginning of investigating. It is the beginning of entertaining the possibility that this is vastly beyond what we've been told it is, vastly beyond what people are, in general, are saying it is. <clears throat> and we discover some interesting self-evident facts which is, one of which is, for example, that the world only exists when you are looking at it. You know, that's really interesting. Oh, it's just, you know, it's just, well, of course it's there, but it's, you know, it's kind of like the refrigerator light bulb, you know. <laughs> it, it, it comes on when the door's open, but, but, but you don't know unless the door's open, so you can't know if it's good. So. <laughs> But, you know, we have these phenomena of dreams at night. And when we go to sleep at night, we dream, and we seem to be in a world. We seem to be there. And the world is, you know, all around us, to whatever degree it is. And there can be relatively complex situations and phenomena apparently going on. Other people, other things, really complex situations and motivations and all sorts of things that work their, work their way out or not. And it's at the time it's it's very convincing. If you if you have had lucid dreams, then you might be aware of how actual the dream experience can be. It's exactly as actual as this experience. It's exactly as convincing as the idea that you're sitting in this room in Berkeley, you know, listening to this talk. <clears throat> but then you wake up and it's gone. In fact, you look back on it, it never was there. It was just a dream. <coughs> but this isn't like that. You know, this, this, this objectively exists. Notwithstanding the fact that you go to sleep and poof, this is gone. <laughs> Completely gone. You know, and you don't even remember it ever existed. <laughs> so, if we begin to look at what this experience actually consists of, it turns out to have some very interesting properties that are slippery and obviously very strange and yet completely explicit. These are not things that are that you have to talk yourself into or elusive in a sense that you have to imagine them. You know, try and look and look at time, for example. Time is a very interesting thing. Okay, where's the past? You know? It's gone. You know, the the words I was saying at the beginning of this sentence I'm saying right now do not exist. They completely do not exist. You can't touch them. You can't find them. They're absolutely gone. Where is the future? Where is the sentence that I'm about to say? It completely does not exist. It's it's not like it's sort of waiting in the wings, sort of ghostly, and it's slowly getting more and more material as it inches towards the present moment. So, there's no past and no future. Well, that's very interesting. You know, most of us maybe sort of wander around with sort of some idea of a, a sort of a smeared out timescape, like a map of sort of what I did yesterday, what I did the day before, what I'm going to do tomorrow, and it's all sort of, you know, sketched in more or less roughly, and the present moment is just kind of in there somewhere. But if you look at what's actually going on, the present moment is here. It's now, there is no past, there is no future. Well, that's kind of interesting, okay. Now, everything that exists, exists in the present moment, 
and everything that exists exists in your consciousness. And another really interesting fact, if you look carefully, you can notice, you can readily discover that your consciousness is the only consciousness that exists as far as you know. You're the sole inhabitant of your universe. There's these other people apparently out there who are talking and acting as if they had consciousness, just like they're you know, patterns of light in the movie that are talking and acting as if they have consciousness. There are apparitions that show up in a dream that are acting and talking as if they had consciousness. You wake up in the morning, how many people were there when you were dreaming? You. you know, although in the dream it doesn't seem like it. You might be really involved with somebody or a group of people or some complex situation, right? But you wake up and poof! It was all me. And here you are. Who else is here? as far as you know. Who else is here? You're the sole observer of all of this, right, as far as you can tell. Now, other people may exist, may not exist, but that's just an idea that can happen in your consciousness, but you have absolutely no access to that. It's completely hypothetical, just like the existence of the past. The past may exist. The past may have actually happened, you know? I mean, think of a dream. In the dream, there, there seems to be the present moment and there seems to be a past. So you, so you sort of feel like what has happened, sort of the, the back story, you know, the back plot of what got you to where you seem to be at that moment in the dream. And, of course, nothing ever happened because there's nothing happening in a dream, even though it seems as if something has been happening, right? But the operative word there, of course, is seems because... You know, not in a dream, not only is there no past, there's no present. <laughs> and yet if you take these things simplistically, if you just take them at face value, when you're dreaming, it's just like, oh yeah, all this stuff is happening and this whole story happens and then it happens and then you wake up and then all this stuff is happening and this whole story happens and it has continuity and it goes along and there's a past, a present and a future and you know, continuity and all of this. But then you look a little more closely at what actually is going on here, you know, is that really so? You know, can you really verify that experientially, experimentally? Can you really find the evidence to irrefutably support these notions? And you know, what evidence can you find irrefutably? You can find the existence of what you call your consciousness. You can't find what it is. You can't find it. You go looking for it, and it's like, woo! It's a snipe point all of a sudden. Where did it go? You can't find it, and yet it's completely self-evident and completely explicit and completely obvious. Your consciousness is a fact, right? But try and find that fact. Try and pin that fact down. Try and see exactly what that fact consists of explicitly, and phew, it's like trying to find a ghost. <laughs> You know, and the and the uh, the very interesting thing is, okay, try and find what the outside world is, and the same thing happens. The outside world is a very ghostly, strange phenomena. Even, you know, this is not esoteric metaphysics. Modern scientists are finding the same thing. You go looking at what matter is, and it turns out to be these clouds of probabilities. You know, it's like what the fuck is a cloud of probability? You know, what are these things? Where are these things? Are they even things? You know, and scientists are scratching their heads saying, well, you know, we can't really say. And that's what this really is. I mean, that's what you find when you look really close. This is not a leap of abstraction or a leap of intellection. This is the actual nuts and bolts of what is present and we see this in our own, without having to get into a bunch of electron microscopes and radio telescopes and stuff and, and atom smashers, we see this directly in our own experience. You know, try and pin down exactly what anything is. What exactly does anything look like? You know, what does this cup look like? Does it look like this? 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 Does, you know, if I'm three miles away from it, does it look like this? You know, there's no fixed version of this cup. This cup is an experience. 
It's, a ra- it's an infinite range of experiences. And in the instant, in any given instant, if I took a snapshot of it, it's one particular experience. But when I look very, very closely at that snapshot, it's fuzzy. So I can't even pin it, like, exactly where are the edges of this cup? Well, when I begin to look very closely, the edges are fuzzy. Where does the cup end and the atmosphere begin? You know? It literally is not sharp. Like when kids are doing a drawing, you know, they'll draw a sharp outline around things. You know, this is a house, and they'll draw an outline of a house and color it in. The real world isn't like that. There's no outlines. There's just these sort of fields of variability that you can't really pin, quite pin down. You know, what color is anything? What color is my face? You know, you look at it, and, well, it's, it's a million colors. It's a billion colors. And in the next instant, it's, 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 it's morphed and it's something else. You know, you can't, what color, you know, what do I look like? What do you look like? You ever had this experience? You look in the mirror and it's like, what do I look like? And, you know, you, you have a million different takes on what you look like and you can never pin it down. You know, I mean, this is the basis of our insecurity. One of the bases of our insecurities, you know, we can't pin anything down and we think we have this sort of a, we've been indoctrinated into a sort of a basic mind frame that we're supposed to, we're supposed to know who we are, we're supposed to know what things are, we're supposed to have a bead on things, we're supposed to have it be able to sort of tie things down and sharpen them up and know what things are, otherwise we're kind of losing it, you know, we're a little iffy, we're a little marginal, we're not really competitive, we can't really hold up our end of things, so we, you know, like, I've got it together, yeah, I know what's going on. But we all know we're faking it, because we all know we kind of, we're kind of struggling. I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe, maybe someone here has, has got it down, but... In, in my experience, things are very fuzzy, very, very fuzzy. So when I look in the outer world, I find basically a highly detailed fuzziness that I can't really lock down. When I look inside a consciousness, woo, you know, <laughs> you don't find anything. And yet it's not nothing. It's It's totally obvious that there is consciousness, but you can't find it, you know, it, it's the damnedest thing. So you, so no matter where you look, you're sort of in this indeterminacy, you know, and there's no past and there's no future. The present can't really be found. I mean, how long does the present last? Look really closely at your experience of time. Well, the, the present is already, the present circumstances are already fading and they're already turning into the past as they occur, so they stopped existing. And... The future circumstances come into existence, but as soon as they come into existence, they stop existing because they're turning into the past. You know, so the present lasts, what, a second? You know, a nanosecond? No time at all? Yeah. So that's very interesting. So the, the present moment has zero duration. So all this is here, basically never, because it doesn't stick around. It's already gone. <clears throat> Another way of saying that is, if you take a picture, suppose you had a, a, an imaginary camera that was incredibly precise, it could just get the sharpest snapshot, ultimately snarp, sharp snapshot, and you took a picture of something. When you look closely at that picture, very closely, everything's going to be blurry, because everything's moving. Nothing is staying still. So, you take a faster photo, you up your camera speed by double. What do you find? Everything's blurry. Isn't that interesting? Okay, you take a faster photo. You up it by a thousand times. What do you find? Everything's blurry. Nothing is actually anywhere. Everything is going somewhere. So all of these are just points of inquiry, points of investigation to look into what is actually going on here. And the most immediate and the most powerful result of any serious inquiry is the discovery that, well, I'm not sure, but it sure as hell isn't what I've been told. It sure as hell isn't what the sort of the zeitgeist, the sort of the man on the street, common sense view of humans in the world is. So, and that's pretty provocative. That leaves us where? So... Wow, if everyone is clueless, that's a pretty interesting chunk of information. So it kind of, you know, if you're, 
if you're a, a serious person, if you're a motivated person, if you're a thinking person, you might that might lead you to go, wow, some you know, let me look into this a little more. Or you might just go, oh, fuck it, you know, go on about your life. Can't be bothered. <laughs> What's for dinner? <laughs> Tonight I'd like to start talking about um, um, <clears throat> very subtle ways of of falling off of noticing. <clears throat> and then In the, uh, in the early phases, so to speak, it's really easy, it's really obvious that noticing kicks in because it's, whoa, you know. Um, and the challenge is just to have anything happening at all on that front at all. But when you get a little, a little, a little more experienced and a little more comfortable with noticing, the challenges become more subtle. Um, and I'm using this word noticing euphemistically the way I always do to refer to something which can't be defined but if you don't know what it is by now <laughs> um, anyway um, probably the, the most easy and, and easy way to fall off it that that presents itself is taking this as anything at all um, and it's very interesting the actual condition of this because the actual condition of this presents as myriad qualities and yet none of these qualities actually exist as such if you be with them profoundly if you be with what they actually are. <clears throat> it's very easy to see a quality that seems self-evident, like you know, clarity or radiance or you know, anything, any any quality whatsoever, <clears throat> even being, beingness. You know, they seem very self-evident on the surface that they exist, but they actually don't. No, none of these qualities actually exists, which is a very strange state of affairs. Um, but it's easy to not notice that because it's a, it's a very subtle fact that this is the case. That this, even though it generates all qualities and appears as all qualities, it cons does not consist of any of them. None of these qualities actually exist, even though they apparently exist in the context of this. So this is that, you know, that whereby qualities seem to exist, but none of these qualities actually exist. Nothing whatsoever can actually be found, you know, and I mean that in the strongest possible sense, which is, you know, it's a very strange state of affairs. It's easy to have to hold subtly, or maybe less subtly, but it's easy, it's easy to hold it subtly that, well, yeah, but there is something, you know. There's something. There's there's something to be found. There's something there. There's something that is a certain way, and it, and it's easy to have that become a self fulfilling prophecy because you can be with this, be with qualities that are presented in a very profound way, and feel like, oh yeah, this is it. And 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 it's paradoxical because of course this is it. Any of the qualities that, pre that present are this, but they are not actually this they are a symptom of this they are a you know a spore of this and this can be a very fine point especially because uh, the nature of the mind is to constantly be you know the thinking mind is to constantly be seizing upon versions of things you know naming things designating things oh this is this oh this is that qualifying things comparing things and all of this and um, so to be able to be with this, the actual this, and allow it to be absolutely open-ended, while simultaneously the mind, of course, will be doing its mind thing, 
of designating and, and trying to fix it and trying to get to the bottom of things. You know, it, it, the mode that, that, that is developable is almost like a kind of a schizophrenia, where you're, in one sense, the mind is in its mind mode, but that exists in the context of this non-mode of the actual of this. <clears throat> and of course, the, and of course, the mind mode most, most profoundly also can't be found. The mind mode is actually, of course, this because all qualities that seem to present are actually this. Um, but again, uh, it, it, this cannot be put clearly. This cannot be described clearly. But uh, it, it's the coexistence of the apparition of all qualities all functionalities in the context of their actual non-existence as such. Uh, and it's easy, it's very easy of course to get confused about that, to get confused on that issue because it's uh, um, because it's very strange because these qualities do exist in, as, in the sense that they do exist but they don't exist. <laughs> <coughs> Essentially, yes, extrasensory perception, um, which may not be as, as mystical as it sounds. The simple fact that we have experience that's not readily characterizable as a, a particular sense field. We have all kinds of experience. We experience moods, we experience funny vibes, we experience, you know, just... We don't really have words for, for these kinds of things because they aren't generally acknowledged as something that we talk about explicitly. But, you know, I mean, if any of you that have ever had um, strong drug experiences or had a high fever or done deep meditation or just experienced your, noticed aspects of your experience that are outside of the normal sort of a human focus of your person and your life and your day-to-day -day business, will notice there's a lot going on, um, most of which is completely ignored as a sort of background noise. Um, and it can have all sorts of content. It can have um, specifically what might be categorized as extrasensory phenomena, psychic phenomena, these kinds of things in it as well. But what it is, is fundamentally unknown. <coughs> but more to the point is that what our sensory experience is, is fundamentally unknown. It's not what you think it is. What's going on here is not what you think it is. It's not what you can think it is. You, there's no way to get a handle on what's happening here. What's happening here is surpassingly strange, surpassingly peculiar. And the fact that we hold it as a kind of a normalcy with, a, with, the, with the, the sort of the, you know, consensus reality man on the street worldview um, is a gross oversimplification of what it actually consists of. And by doing so, by, by simplifying it, we cut ourselves off from appreciating what it is, from appreciating what we are, um, and from really participating in this, uh, or, or uh, I should say more exactly, from really noticing that we are participating in this on as profound a level as we are. Um, these, these sort of un relatively unacknowledged areas of our experience are interesting not in themselves but to notice the way in which our experience is present and yet undefined unknown somehow and in these, these sort of outside the boundaries so to speak <coughs> aspects of our experience this is pretty obvious you can go to these parts of your experience that are just sort of just weird little moods or vibes or you know we don't have we don't have words for what they are so you can, it's hard to talk about um, and you notice right away wow there's something there but it's not really connected to anything you know I can't really connect it with with my life I can't connect it with the outside world but it's not entirely disconnected either because it's present as experience and so by noticing this is valuable because it gives us a clue 
a, a new perspective on how to look at our or, at our norm, our so-called normal experience, the, the, our sensory experience, and these sorts of things that we are used to, very used to, noticing and being invested in from a new perspective, <coughs> and to see that uh, to, you know to possibly be able to see that there's aspects of of all of our experience, even our most familiar experience that are wholly unfamiliar that we typically just censor or don't ignore because we're so busy going to the gross obvious describable aspects of that rather than being with the subtleties and the nuances and the, the vibes and the flavors and you know all sorts of things that are a little less explicit in terms of how we usually put things what we usually talk about what humans are usually concerned with Karma is a, a word that has all sorts of baggage and tradition and, and concepts and stories and interpretations associated with it, all of which is best forgotten. In the world. What it actually refers to is the degree to which experience seems to be patterned, seems to have a degree of patterning to it. And inclusive of that is the the apparent um, implications of that patterning vis-a-vis possible cause and effect, possible existence of entities, possible, you know, um, you know, all these sorts of notions that seem to be possible implications of this patterning that is apparent. Um, the interesting uh, aspect about this karma about this phenomena um, from a spiritual point of view is that we are typically um, hypersensitive to the apparent degree of patterning that seems to be present in our experience and we are largely insensitive to the degree and the nature and the qualities of lack of patterning which is present in our experience. Um, and this is interesting from a spiritual point of view because it's the apparent patterning which creates the implication of bondage, stuckness, suffering, you know, woe is me, all of that stuff. And on the contrary, it's the, it's the apparent lack of patterning which accounts for liberation, accounts for realization of no self, accounts for realization of no mind, accounts for all these other various mythology <coughs> so in a, in a very simplistic sense again from a spiritual point of view um, to move from a sense of bondage to a sense of liberation from the karmic point of view simply means to become more sensitive to the the, 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 the quantity and the Qualities of the degree of unpatternedness which is present within experience. Um, now, the patterning and the unpatternedness are very interesting because they conceptually they seem to be, you'd think they were opposites, but they aren't opposites. They coexist. Um, they interpenetrate each other. They are aspects of each other in a way which is um, not very rationally describable or addressable. <coughs> Um, all spirituality whatsoever no matter what tradition or non-tradition it comes from essentially consists of using form to discover essence now exactly what is meant by form and exactly what is meant by essence is part of this path of discovery you can't pin down exactly what it is about until you are well well engaged mm -hmm. with it. <coughs> um, the major hitching point in virtually all spirituality consists of confusing form in essence. We think that a particular form is somehow spiritual or elevated or advantageous, i.e. somehow essential, and then we essentially stop using that form 
as a vehicle to essence and take the form as a destination. This is very commonplace with people to become experts in meditation or in yoga or in various other traditions, um, singing kirtan, all these kinds of things. Um, it's very commonplace to mistake these forms as ends in themselves rather than seeing them as they truly are, as jumping off points, as opportunities to discover and further explore essence. <clears throat> in, in true spirituality, form is like a diving board, and the point of the diving board is to use it to jump into the damn pool, not to hang out on the diving board or collect diving boards or become an expert in diving boards. The diving board is there for one purpose, to jump into the pool. So the diving board, it's all about departing from the diving board. The diving board, the very essence, the essential function of a diving board is to leave it, to leave it behind, to use it as a as a jumping off point, literally in this case, for entering the pool. And likewise, form, all forms in spiritual investigation are jumping off points, they're diving boards. They serve their purpose only when you depart from them. They are points of departure, they are not destinations. <clears throat> um, and it seems to be very easy to become confused about this, it seems to be very easy to um, be murky about this because so many of these forms seem to be such departures from normal life. You know, if you're if you're a banker or a businessman or a retailer or something, and you go, you know, join a meditation sect and you spend eight hours a day staring at a wall or something, you may feel like, oh wow, this has been a big departure. But it's misunderstanding the entire functional principle that these forms are launch pads. They are launch pads. It's about achieving escape velocity. It's not about hanging out on the launch pad as a destination. <clears throat> now form and essence themselves are very interesting. What is form? Well, anything is form. Form is experience. Form is the apparitions of experience, what appears as experience. <clears throat> so, uh, any aspect of one's experience can be um, a vehicle for exploration of essence, a vehicle as a jumping, to, to, as a starting point, uh, let's say, to jump off into an exploration of the essence that is um, included therein. The relationship between form and essence proves to be inconceivably subtle. And we don't really discover this until we're well on the way of uh, of this path of exploration to because we can't really know what essence is until we're pretty thoroughly embedded in it. <clears throat> where we think we're going is not where we're actually going. <laughs> in that regard, it's probably a little bit like jumping off a cliff. <laughs> But the, the essential movement from form to essence is a movement into in finer subtlety, increased subtlety, moving from the coarse to the subtle, moving from the obvious to the refined. And um, essentially developing an appreciation for subtlety, an appreciation for the refined, um, to discover to push the envelope of our own sensitivity to what subtlety is, to how subtle this can be, to how refined this can be, to how nuanced these aspects of our experience can be. We're all very familiar with the coarse aspects of experience. Certainly, you know, our sensory experience in the world and our personalities and all these very obvious aspects. <clears throat> but to move from that, from whatever layer degree of subtlety we're used to being with this obviousness to a more refined 
relationship, a more subtle relationship, a more nuanced relationship, a more implicit relationship. This is the true spiritual path. And it goes ultimately until essence and form are seen as an absolute essential unity. <clears throat> But this is not something that it's useful to try to contrive or even aspire to. Rather, wh whatever form you're working with, try to penetrate it, try to move into a, a degree of increased subtlety, a degree of increased nuance in terms of appreciating what it is, in terms of um, exploring how it presents itself. Because there is a, certainly an infinite degree of subtlety and nuance that is being presented within our experience. <laughs> and noticing this and coming into relating to our experience in terms of that is the essence of true spirituality. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> this is not what you think it is. This is the essence of the spiritual conundrum, is that this is not what we think it is. <clears throat> it can't be what you think it is, no matter how sophisticated or elaborate or subtle your conception of it is, your worldview, because what this actually is, is a condition that cannot be thought, it cannot be modeled, it cannot be caught in conceptuality. <clears throat> and true spirituality comes uh, as simple, as simply the condition of coming to realize that this is the case, coming to see what this actually is. <clears throat> and it does not require any specialized activities. It doesn't require changing your name to a Hindu name or dressing in funny clothes or, or not dressing in funny clothes or any sorts of behaviors or skills or anything in particular, simply simply noticing what this actually is, noticing what this is as it is immediately present, as your experience. <clears throat> and you will notice that it, although it may somewhat conform to what you're used to thinking it is, although the labels that you're used to giving to the conditions and situations that seem to present themselves are not wholly inaccurate, yet they fail to capture in its completeness what is actually present. And in this failure is absolute missing the mark. And we typically don't notice this. We typically think, well, yeah, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I'm kind of close. I've got a pretty good idea, and I know pretty much what's what and who's who. And even though I can't really, you know, explain it all with, with absolute authority and with absolute certainty, like a, you know, a PhD physicist and a Nobel Prize winning sociologist and economist might be able to, they know what's going on. I don't quite have that, but, you know, I, I kind of know what's going on. It's not like that. It's not like that. <clears throat> because the very nature of what this is is not knowable as a specific condition, as a specific state of affairs that can be delineated, that can be understood, that can be analyzed. <clears throat> and in point of fact, the more specifically we try to understand it, the farther we dig ourselves into a hole of fantasy and delusion. It's very much like in a dream. If you're dreaming last night and you, you, there's people talking and they're saying something and you're not quite sure who's talking and not quite sure what they're saying. So if you want to know what's really going on, trying to pin down who's actually talking and what they're actually saying is not going to take you closer to the seeing that what's actually going on, which is that it's a dream. On the contrary, it's going to embed you further and further in unreality, the supposition that there's an actual objective circumstance going on, other than the dream, which is the actual condition. And we find ourselves in a very similar situation here. 
the very nature of what this is is that it presents as if there's all sorts of apparent conditions and circumstances that seem to be more or less um, uh, uh, independently existing, more or less uh, causally interactive, all these sorts of things. <clears throat> but in actual fact, that's not the case at all. And so the more we pursue this, the more we try and analyze what exactly is present, how it is present, how it works, how it interacts, the, f the farther we are getting from what it actually is, and, the, and we're getting deeper and deeper into fantasy construction, into an imaginary view of things which bears no relationship to the actuality. <clears throat> And this simple state of affairs is the only thing that needs to be discovered for the spiritual conundrum to be addressed and solved. What this is, is knowable, it is discoverable, but it does not conform to the categories of any of the sorts of things we're used to thinking exist as things, as conditions that are discoverable. But it is discoverable, it is knowable because you intrinsically are this, so you have absolute intimate access to and presence in this. Um, so you can know it by its own means of knowing, which are wholly irrational and nonlinear and immediate and inconceivable and undescribable. <clears throat> so simply by being in your experience as it actually is, as the reality of your experience, um, it will reveal itself to you as what it is. Uh, if you can be with it without preconceptions, without presuppositions, expecting it to conform to whatever worldviews you have, whatever sort of uh, materialist philosophy or I psychological ideas or concepts of different entities existing and all that, if you can suspend all of the way you're used to holding things, <coughs> and just be with experience nakedly as if you did not know what it is whatsoever and just see what you find. As an absolutely unbiased observer, an absolutely unbiased researcher with no preconceptions. And typically this is very difficult for us to do because we aren't even aware that we have preconceptions. We just think it's just reality. It's just how things are, you know? Sure, the world's the world, you know, people are people, this is Berkeley, you know, all these sorts of things that we don't question because we don't know that they're questionable, we just think they're objectively true. And so these certitudes that we hold prevent us from, see, or, or severely impede us from noticing what this actually is. In actuality, all of your experience consists of <coughs> awareness engaging with present energy within experience. In other words, it's a closed system. So there is awareness, there's the experiencing faculty, and then there is energy appearing to that awareness, you know, perceiving faculty. And it happens right here. Right? I mean, this is it. This is this, there's nothing happening other than your experience, which is happening right here, right now, within your experience, within your awareness, right? Now, what we typically do is we... And so this is a, a very direct, immediate engagement, extremely localized, so to speak, extremely intimate. But there is a faculty within consciousness, within intelligence, which is an abstracting faculty, which basically um, projects this direct energy engagement as if it was involving a departure from itself. So, for, for example, um, in other words, your, your awareness is very directly engaged with the energy of, that is being presented as what you seem to be experiencing, right, very intimately. But this abstracting faculty projects 
this energy as if it was an objective situation um, and engages with itself, which is always already happening very immediately, engages with itself as if it was removed, as if it was a, 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 an objective situation that, in, that has various implicit complications and typically has a goal in mind. So in other words, when you engage with your experience, typically it's it, in terms of this abstracting faculty, it shows up as having a, a goal. There's a point to it, you know. You, 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 you learn yoga in order to develop yoga and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an implicit sort of a carrot on a string. If after ha- having learned yoga, I will achieve something which is worth achieving. So it's, it's kind of a departure from direct experience. Obviously, it's taking place within direct experience, but in, in the abstraction, it seems to be a departure from the direct experience through an imagined objective compli- complication that then ends up with some goal, which, of course, occurs within the direct experience. So it's like departing from your direct experience and going through a rather more or less elaborate series of complications to come back to your direct experience. So, you know, the, the, the ramifications and implications of this are, are huge. But um, the, the spiritual, in, in, in very brief terms, the spiritual process consists of extracting ourselves from this from, from seeing the necessity of this imagined abstraction process, of this imagined needing to generate complications in order to find solutions to bring us back to where we started from, ultimately, even though we aren't necessarily aware that that's what's happening, that's what it turns out to be. Short-circuiting that so that we can engage with our awareness directly and get what there is to get in real time, immediately, right here, right now without needing to go through these elaborate abstractions of, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to engage in that and it's going to get me somewhere and that somewhere it gets me, of course, is going to turn out to be right here, right now because where else can you be to get any kind of reward? Any kind of reward or any kind of an achievement you can actually realize is going to turn out to be this that is already the case right here. And so getting this through our thick heads, getting this through our sloppy karma, is, is uh, the essence of spirituality, the essence of this inquiry, of this yoga. <clears throat> um, and this, this, in, this encompasses and includes all human activity. You, know, you go out and you go to college and you, learn, you get your MBA and you become a banker and you make lots of money. What's the point of it all? Well, you want to be happy. Right? You want... So you, get, you find happiness. And what does happiness consist of? It consists of being in your experience and enjoying it. Which, of course, was your starting point. I mean, whether or not you were enjoying it. <laughs> so, so, it so it's this elaborate departure and going through a system of complications to come back where you are. Or typical spiritual engagement. You know, you go find a teacher and you learn to meditate or you, you get a mantra and you change your name to some Indian name and you, and you wear funny clothes and you travel to India and you spend 20 years and you learn to meditate or whatever. And all. What, what's the goal? What, what are you trying to get to? You're trying to get to simply being ultimately just in this condition of experiencing that is already the case. So the point is to learn to see that this abstraction process doesn't lead to anything actual. All it leads to is what has already been the case, which is experience. You start from your experience, and then you never actually depart from your experience. All this, all of this departure exists in imagination, in abstraction. You're always right in your experience. You're at college getting your MBA. Well, you're not really in college getting your MBA. You're just in your experience. You're just spin doctoring it. Oh, I'm in college. I'm getting my MBA. But you're just in your experience, right? And you're out being an investment banker, and but you're just in your experience, you know. And then you get rich, and you finally, you know, have power and wealth, and you know, a beautiful spouse, and and uh, you know, some rental friends and whatever. <laughs> and, 
and where are you? You're just in your experience, which is where you started from. So, so it, it's been a zero-sum game all the way, uh, with all this imaginary complication leading to an imaginary reward or an imaginary achievement, which in actuality can be nothing other than the initial condition, which you never have departed from. So, my suggestion is, <laughs> why not <coughs> give some attention to what our condition is from the beginning and then see if all of this abstraction and all of this imaginary departure actually is, is worth the effort, actually accomplishes anything, or if there might not be a much more efficient, much shorter way of going about it, i.e., not bothering. <laughs> the entire um, solution to the spiritual dilemma is extremely simple. It just consists of seeing what this is, discovering what this actually is, um, and the entire spiritual problem consists equally simply of not seeing what this is, of not noticing what this is, of misinterpreting it, of holding it to be something that it's not. When we hold it to be something that it's not, it happens that the way we hold it to be implies all sorts of problems, all sorts of difficulties, all sorts of suffering, all sorts of frustrations, all sorts of unresolvable situations. And so we find ourselves living a life of struggle, a life of frustration, a life of confusion, a life of um, you know, fight, pushing away from pain and struggling towards pleasure in whatever form that seems to um, be implicit in our lives, in our approach to our lives. But in actuality, what this is, uh, is entirely other than what we can possibly hold it to be. And all we need to do is see what this is, actually see very clearly what this is, which is actually doable, it's possible. In fact, it's very easy because it's right here in front of us. It's, it's, it's here to see, and there's nothing blocking it. The only thing blocking it is our preconceptions of what we think it is, which are always erroneous. <coughs> and the, <coughs> the repercussions or implications of seeing what this is turns out to be freedom from suffering, freedom from pain, freedom from confusion, and um, well, you could say essentially things like endless enjoyment and all that, but it's easier to say, come and, come and see for yourself. <laughs> so the only problem we have is that we misinterpret this. We think that we know what it is, and that thinking that we know what it is prevents us from noticing what it actually is. And typically we hold these beliefs or this sort of frame of reference or worldview unconsciously, so we don't really know we're doing it. We just think it's objectively true, so we, we tend not to exercise critical thinking on it. We tend not to, to criticize it or deconstruct it or notice the fallacies in what we're thinking this experience is compared to what it actually is. We just buy into our subliminal belief system and unquestioningly, and we just sit there and... Um, live with the suffering that that seems to uh, imply or include. <clears throat> now, no interpretation can be true because what this actually is cannot be grasped by ideas, cannot be accurately indicated by concepts, it cannot be comprehensively um, uh, viewed by the conscious mind. It just can't be done. It's like uh, apples and oranges. The What this is does not resolve itself down to concepts, down to separate notions, down to specific ideas. And so to the extent to which we expect it to, in other words, the extent to which we expect our ideas and our thinking to accurately approach reality or to even um, practically approach reality in any terms um, is the extent to which we are deluded because it cannot be done. No thought can be true, no thought can be accurate, no idea can indicate reality. Reality is wholly beyond thought, wholly beyond conscious thought. Now, this is not a problem because you don't need thought to get to reality, it's right here, it's not going anywhere. You don't need to think about it, you have it already. And you are already exp experiencing it on a non-thought basis, most intimately. 
and with an incredible intelligence. Um, <coughs> intelligence is, does not depend upon thought. Intelligence does not depend upon the conscious mind. Intelligence is, is, is hardwired into, let's say, the spontaneous functioning of consciousness. It's just a simply experiencing is an, is an inconceivable act of intelligence. Thus, thus the direct experience of your field of vision, say, is an incredibly intelligent act. Without thinking about it, you are perceiving astounding quantities of data, experiencing it discreetly, separating it, sorting it, directly seeing exactly what everything is, whether or not you can put it into words. Of course, you can't put it into words pre-consciously when you're just seeing it, but the intelligence is seeing it. And this intelligence, this primary intelligence, which, is, which actually experiences your experience immediately, is the, intel the actual intelligence, the powerful intelligence that you are, and that can grasp reality, can experience reality, because it already does. <clears throat> and then, this, then, then the subsequent conceptualization of thinking about, oh, I'm seeing the hillside club, I'm seeing people sitting in chairs, I'm seeing you know, the thoughts about it. The, the, the events already happened, bang. It's like, a, it's like an instantaneous taking a snapshot, bang. The field of vision is just there, long before you think about it. And then you can sort of add thought onto it of you know, labeling this, labeling that, interpreting this, interpreting that, analyzing this conceptually. But these concepts and these labels do not nearly approach what this actually is. That first snapshot, the first event of, of actual real-time experience is inconceivably beyond anything you can think about it. But you are inconceivably beyond anything you can think about yourself too, so that's fine. So you are with this primary experience. You are this inconceivable intelligence that is already completely in operation, in play, as your experience. And it's simply a matter of noticing that fact, appreciating it on its own, in its own terms, let's say, or appreciating it as it is. In Zen Buddhism, there is a delightful koan, which is translated something like, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? And it seems like a simple question, well, to see what the East is like. But if we strip that this question of its exotic Easternness and Buddhisticness and um, metaphysical history, we could translate we translate the question to why are you here? Why are you here? Well it seems like a simple question. <coughs> Oh, well, I heard about it on the internet, and I thought I'd come by and check it out. <clears throat> but if you look a little deeper, the question, why am I here? <clears throat> also includes, how do things work? How do things happen? <clears throat> what is it that's going on here? What, what's happening? How does it happen? And of course we notice we're inextricably bound up in this. Here you are, here this is, how's it happening? What is it that's happening? But, you know, we're used to thinking we know. It's, well, you know, we, we're, we're here, we're human beings, we have to get up and try to find a little happiness or, you know, get through the day somehow and <clears throat> all of which is fine on it, as far as it goes <clears throat> but it doesn't really answer the question does it what's going on here what is this what is this this is the essence of spirituality That simple question, what is this? What are you? They're the same question, really, of course. You can't answer the one without answering the other. 
Is my voice coming through okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a crow then. <coughs> so what is this? What is going on here? We usually think we know to some extent, one extent or another. We may have very simplistic explanation or we may have done a lot of meditation and read a lot of spiritual books or studied philosophy and we can develop very sophisticated notions about what's going on there but they'll all be wrong every one of them will be wrong for the simple reason that what this is right here right now cannot be captured conceptually you can't wrap your mind around it. You cannot collapse it to an idea. You cannot collapse it to a description. You cannot collapse it to um, a caption. So all our usual socially accepted human modes of apprehending things, of trying to figure things out, of trying to know things and describe things and think about them, don't apply to this. This is beyond that mode. It just can't be done. You cannot have an accurate idea of this. It's impossible. But fortunately, you don't need an accurate idea of it because you have direct access. You are it. You don't need to think about it. You have most intimate, most intimate engagement with this, with what this is. And this engagement is the vehicle through which this can reveal itself to you, through which this can reveal what it is to you in astounding profundity. (laughs) But you have to be willing to give up normal human modes of engagement, normal human modes of relationship. Um, What this is, is not about this and you. You are it. It is you. So, how do you look at it? It requires a different mode than the normal mode that we're used to perhaps used to relating in, where we are more or less thinking of ourselves as me and dealing with objects and people and environments and situations as that. Now this may sound a little abstract, but in actual fact, this is most intimate, most concrete, just this simple event right here. That's what we're talking about. This. This. Present. It's present, you know. The most accurate word we have for it is experience. What is present if not experience? And can you find anything whatever present other than experience? What is this experience? You know, again, in our normal consensus reality modes, we're used to thinking of experience as, well, my brain's functioning, and it sort of spins out some consciousness, and it's looking through my eyes, and I'm looking at this world I'm in, and there's all these objects and situations and people and things. But experience is right here. Experience is one thing. You can't find pieces in it. You know, you, you look at me, you look at your hand, you look at the wall. There's no difference in the experience. Experience is the same presence. It's the same presence. The wall is present. What I call the wall is present as much as what I call you is present, as much as what I call my hand is present. What is this presence? This presence is the mystery of experience is. 
astounding presence. It never becomes more present. It never becomes less present. When you do something, when you do really good stuff and you live a moral <laughs> life and you're just an up, upstanding citizen, it doesn't, the presence doesn't get improved. You know, when you're just breaking all the rules and being self-destructive and being a real jerk and, and you know, uh, being a despicable human being, the presence doesn't get, doesn't diminish. The presence is not affected by what happens in it, is it? Isn't that interesting? It's not improved by meditation. It's not improved by focusing and clarity and concentration. It's not diminished by spacing out. It's not diminished by distraction. It's doing itself. It's completely independent. It's just this amazing presence. And we, we used to think, well, of course it's presence. Yeah, but what's going on? You know, what's the, where, what's the, where's the action? What's the story? What, you know, what's, what's the plot line here? What's, you know, what's in it for me? Presence. Yeah, of course there's presence. It's like saying there's being. Yeah, of course there's being. You know, and we're used to writing this off, writing this presence off, writing this being off. But we're throwing the baby out of the bathwater when we do this because in this presence, the absolute profundity is nakedly revealed to you every instant. <clears throat> it's inclusive. It, every aspect of itself is always completely clearly displayed, completely clearly revealed. And by just being with this presence, noticing it, and especially let go of the preconceptions you have about what you used to think it is. Let it be present as an unknown. You know, just drop all expectations and preconceptions and here this is, what is it? And in that context, it can show you what it is and what it reveals is inconceivably profound. And you discover you are this presence. You discover the world is this presence. The universe is this presence. It's one thing. It's inconceivable and miraculous. It's doing itself. It's and it's not dependent upon circumstances, which is which is very um, huge. It has profound implications. Since this presence is not dependent upon circumstances, and since you are this presence, that means you yourself are beyond circumstances. That's kind of interesting if you think about it. We're used to thinking of ourselves perhaps as being knocked around by our circumstances and we need to defend ourselves and protect ourselves and really sort of position ourselves strategically with regards to the circumstances that seem to be presenting themselves. What if you were completely beyond circumstances? What if you were invulnerable? What if you were you know, made of uh, divine Teflon. It's a technical term. <coughs> I don't have the Sanskrit. <laughs> But just this question, why am I here? Why am I here? Leads to, inevitably, to this presence, to this function. What is this? How does it work? How does, why is it doing what it's doing? How is it doing what it's doing? <coughs> and it's not what we're used to thinking of. The entire edifice of spirituality comes down to this one issue, this one issue of what is this? What is this that's going on? And all of the 
modern trappings of self-improvement and lifestyle and changing your name to a Hindu name and all these spiritual practices and all that have their orientation, their focus ultimately around just this one simple vision. What is this? What is this? Unfortunately, you are in the perfect position to address that issue because you have complete intimate access to the object of your investigation. The, the question has an answer, although it can't be said in words. The question has an answer, it is knowable. You can know what this is. You can know what you are. And it's not what you think what you used to thinking you are, what you used to thinking you are. It's a rather it turns out to be rather a delightful surprise. So what this is, what you are, is completely, utterly, radically, absolutely different and other than what you think it is. And discovering this fact and discovering what this actually is, what you actually are, is what genuine spirituality is all about. Um, Three quarters of the battle is noticing that this is not what you think it is. And then from there on it it's downhill all the way. Uh. Ramana Maharshi, among others, defined the spiritual dilemma uh, in very simple terms as being holding what is real to be unreal and holding what is unreal to be real. Or you could say the non-perception or non-acknowledgement of reality and the perception and acknowledgement of unreality as reality. <clears throat> Which is pretty simple. <clears throat> that may sound sort of grand and abstract and um, historical, but in actual fact, this is an event that happens in real time. Right here, right now, you either see and appreciate what is real and see unreality as such or you don't. So this is not something that happens karmically over lifetimes. It's something that happens in real time. It's something that you're doing right now. <clears throat> and um, in terms of your individual experience, the terms that this shows up in is... Uh, generally abstraction. What seems to be abstract and what seems to be concrete. <clears throat> so, the, the, your, bo your body seems to be very concrete. The chair you're sitting in seems to be very concrete, right? The, the hillside club, the room we're sitting in seems very concrete. People around you seem very concrete. And then there's this awareness and other things which are kind of iffy. I mean, they're, they're certainly here, but they're a little ghostly, a little hard to pin down. So they seem a little more abstract. And then we have these notions like being and reality and presence, which may seem very abstract. <clears throat> In actuality, that hierarchy is completely backwards. The hillside club is a complete abstraction. The chair you're sitting in is a complete abstraction. Your body is a complete abstraction. <clears throat> What's the reality? What's the actuality? Well, experience, isn't it? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there's experience, and on the basis of that fact, the consciousness, the imagination spontaneously draws conclusions. It generates a map, it generates an interpretation of, oh, I see these patterns of light that seem to be 
somewhat stable and you know have some kind of consistency so maybe there's something there some object that's there that accounts for this consistency and this stability you know or in sensation you know there's a kind of a feeling you know in, in what i might call my butt so maybe it's like and and i can see something apparently in the field of vision that seems to be juxtaposed in that general sort of a vicinity <clears throat> if i can go so far as to suppose that space exists and so i can draw the conclusion oh there's a chair in my butt sitting on it and that accounts for this sensation so we generate rooms we generate bodies we generate butts we generate chairs we generate other people all on the evidence of experience so experience is the concrete fact experience is what is concrete experience is what is actual all of these interpretations are abstractions <laughs> so berkeley is an abstraction the reality is simply this experience right the hillside clubs an abstraction the reality is simply this experience so you may take your field of vision and say well i'm seeing the hillside club well how about you're just seeing light and you're supposing that the light is the hillside club partially or the light is also other people the light is also chairs the light is also anything else you may choose to designate within that even light is an abstraction you don't know you're seeing light you don't know what light is light's an idea just like the hillside club's an idea what's actually happening well experience is happening that seems to include what you might think of as vision but vision's an abstraction experience is actual right it's undeniable that there is experience i mean correct me if i'm wrong <laughs> but all of these interpretations are abstractions based on this fact and the fact does not necessarily conform to the abstractions the fact does not necessarily conform to the interpretations that consciousness so effortlessly generates <clears throat> so if you're living your life oriented towards abstractions you're living your life oriented towards things and cities and people and an objective world and activities and interactions you're orienting yourself towards fantasy you're orienting yourself towards unreality you're living an unreal life you're interpreting the reality of your life in unreal terms supposing those to be actual and objective and then you're taking this most concrete present fact of whatever this actuality is that we're arbitrarily calling experience and thinking of it as somehow ghostly or tenuous or made up of these things we're holding to be concrete like bodies and buildings and worlds and such <clears throat> it's all completely backwards and it exactly conforms to ramana maharshi's definition of the spiritual dilemma the spiritual problem <clears throat> taking what is unreal to be real what is an abstraction taking it to be concrete and on the contrary or some or the corollary of taking what is concrete to be relatively an abstraction <clears throat> so what to do <clears throat> Well of course we have we are blessed to have the reality uh the concrete reality present. We are blessed to have actual existence that we are that we consist of that we are completely engaged in. So we have access to reality. So even if we have relatively lost our way in terms of orienting towards these abstractions as if they were real all is not lost because there's no there's actually no momentum there there's no there's no trajectory we do it's something you do in real time you know you have to actually manufacture the hillside club in your imagination in real time every time you look at the wall 
It has no persistence. The experience, the experiencing, has persistence. It ha it's a constant. It doesn't go away. It is what it is inviolably. But it's, there's no sign in experience saying hillside club. Well, there may be one outside, but... <laughs> it's just this presence that we may interpret as light, another abstraction. We may interpret as a field of vision, another abstraction. <clears throat> Even an experience is an abstraction. What is it actually? Well, you can't say, can you? Here it is, but what is this? What is this? It's inconceivable, it's inexpressible. But that doesn't make it inaccessible because it is you. You have complete access, complete integration with this astounding presence. So you can explore it very directly if you have the wit, the good fortune to allow yourself to notice this fact, to notice this presence, and to notice the actuality of it, and that you don't have to approach it through these abstractions. You don't have to approach it through these ideas and interpretations and worldviews that are wholly imaginary. They exist nowhere but in your imagination. So going into this imagination leads nowhere but to more imagination. Going into fantasy leads nowhere but more fantasy. You know, it's, it's a root of madness. You don't, you don't go into madness to find sanity. To, you don't go into fantasy to find actuality. Well, you can, but that's kind of not the easy way. <clears throat> but again, fortunately, the fantasy is a very thin, flimsy, and very partial overlay over this incredibly detailed, actual presence of this reality that you may call experience. So this is accessible. This is something that you can explore if you want to. And doing so leads to what is called spiritual realization. Doing so leads to sanity. Doing so leads to the discovery of what you are, what this is, that turns out to be astounding and surprising and quite different than what you could possibly imagine it to be. <clears throat>
in you. It's a driving force to whatever extent it is in you to address these kinds of questions of, well, what am I? What's going on here? What's really happening? You know, is life really just this, this shallow game you play and, you, and you're trying to, you know, make more money than the next guy and, and then you die? Or, or, or what? Is there more to it than that? <clears throat> Another aspect of this which is associated is the issue of community. It can be very easy, you know, you go to these kinds of talks and you see the same faces and you go to another talk and there's the same bunch of people and say, oh, hi, how you doing? Gosh, I, didn't see, I haven't seen you for a few weeks, how's it going? And so it's easy to form this sort of sense of community. And, and that's very nice, there's nothing wrong with having friends and all that. But again, spirituality is intensely personal, it's about you. It's about where you are, it's about what's going on with you, not about other people. Everyone else is in a different place than you are. Everyone is in a different situation. Their essential spiritual issues, maybe not at core, but in terms of the details, are unique and different than yours. You know, the, the, the kinds of things you're grappling with, the specifics of what you're grappling with, are going to be quite different than the specifics of what other people are grappling with. So this is a, a very personal inquest that you are involved in, to whatever extent you are. And that, of course, differs from person to person. Some people are just completely driven and motivated and obsessed, and this is their whole focus of their life. Other people are more, gosh, you know, this is really some interesting issues, and it, you know, it feels like it has some meat to me, but it's not necessarily something that I feel possessed by or obsessed by. And, all, and there's no right or wrong way. However you are is real. That's where you are at the moment, and that's where, what you have to work from. But again this kind of a, you know, uh, of a group mentality or group attitude or joining a group, you know, becoming a member of a sangha or something can sort of mask this fact and, and um, inculcate a kind of a thought of, well, we're all in it together, we're all kind of in the same place, we're all sort of here participating, kind of like going to church and you're a member of the, you know, the congregation and you're all kind of a, a, a flock, you know. And it, it ain't like that. It ain't like that. These questions are about me. These questions are about you. These questions are about you. And they're intensely personal. And they're intensely actual. They're about what's really going on with you, for real, in your life, here and now. <clears throat> What this is, this right here, this reality, what you are, which is one and the same thing, is very simple. It is never going to be more than what it is right now. It's never going to be less than what it is right now. What it is, is independent of circumstances. An atom bomb could go off right here in this room, and what this is would not be different. Jesus Christ and Buddha and Ramana Maharshi and Padmasambhava could come floating in on a cloud right now and what this is would not be any different than it is right now. <clears throat> the fly in the ointment is that what this is can be misunderstood, what this is can misinterpret itself. <clears throat> can see itself as other than it is with apparently problematic implications. <clears throat> the solution is very simple. See it as it is. Which may be easier said than done for the main reason that you may not be aware, you may not, you may not you may not be aware that you aren't seeing as it is. You may think you are seeing as it is. You may think your version of what this is is accurate. And uh, it's possible to hold understandings of what this is, of what's going on here, of the way that this is, that you're not aware of. You just assume them to be true. You assume them to be real. And you aren't even aware that they are attitudes or positions 
that in actual fact, you are holding in your consciousness, in your imagination. <clears throat> but this is what it is eternally. It can never be different than what it is. What this is right here, right now, is exactly what it has always been and what it always will be. And what this is, is what you are. And it is right here. It is open and available to be seen. So it can be seen. It can be noticed. It can be appreciated in its own terms. And it cannot be appreciated in any terms other than its own terms, with the, with the exception of the typical disastrous results of the common human worldview. <clears throat> What happens is you stop confusing the content of the fantasy with actuality. Fantasy always goes on to some extent, just like thought always goes on to some extent, or sound always goes on to some extent, or smell goes, always goes on to some extent. But you don't confuse the fantasy with your direct experience. And in that context, you see that fantasy is itself a direct experience. Just like thought is a direct experience. Thought is the presence of a, of, a, of a very strange and astounding, you know, call it energy or whatever. Likewise, fantasy is. And the way in which they work and, and what they are and the way they seem to have content is astounding and, and ungraspable. There's no way you can make sense of how it works. But it coexists <clears throat> with all other experience and doesn't actually impact it. Just like your vision coexists with all your other experience and doesn't impact it, doesn't get in the way. So the fact that you're seeing something doesn't get in the way of what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. they're, they're distinct, they're, they're separate, all, all, to the extent that they, you don't confuse the one for the other. And likewise, you, you learn to do the same with fantasy, or actually it's more accurate to say you see to do the same with fantasy, because you see that fantasy is not actually about anything. It's just its own event. So at that point, when you see that, fantasy and all other direct experience no longer become confused. <laughs> it's as if there was a TV on in the next room that someone had left running and the sound turned up, and you can hear people talking and shouting and whatever it is is going on in the soundtrack of the TV show. And it's there, but it doesn't have anything to do with what else is happening in the room where you are, say. So the problem isn't the existence of fantasy. The problem is the confusion of fantasy with actuality and sort of smearing them together. Right. So you think, I'm thinking about this and I'm seeing this, and the thinking and the seeing are the same, about the same thing, so to speak, and it's actually not the case. And it, it's possible to come to see that that's not the case, and then you no longer get them confused. Tonight at dinner, um, the topic of Merlin and his dragon was briefly mentioned. And this caused me to reflect the dragon and a serpent are powerful symbols in mythology around the world and they are very indicative of the very essence of both our spiritual challenge and our spiritual solution <coughs> in the far east of course you have the in, in China and in, in various mythologies, you have this, the symbol of the dragon with the pearl, pearl of wisdom, and the dragon is somehow a guardian of the pearl or somehow is uh, associated with the pearl of wisdom. In Europe, in medieval times, we have the, the mythology of dragons that are guarding great treasures, and it's very treacherous to try to get past the dragon to get to the treasure. <clears throat> and of course in uh, the uh, book of Genesis we have the, the famous serpent in the Garden of Eden with the, the fruit that he tempts Eve with. 
<coughs> and these, sim these symbols are powerful symbols that show up across the board in, in our human mythology. But they're about something that's very specific. They're about a very specific topic. There is a very precise message encoded in this symbol, which very nicely encompasses both the spiritual challenge and the spiritual method. <coughs> Quite simply, the, the serpent or the dragon symbolizes energy, the energy of experience, the energy that shows up as your experience, as that which is present as your experience, as sensation, as thought, as subtler kinds of energies of experience. Basically, anything whatsoever that is experienced can be said to be an energy. And this energy that shows up is precisely what is symbolized by the serpent and the dragon. Because this energy is, by its very nature, oscillatory. It fluctuates, it's alive, it, it, uh, it is not steady. It's binary, where it's on and off. It comes in flashes, it comes in, in dynamism. And the oscillatory motion of a snake or a dragon symbolizes this rather nicely. <coughs> In all of these myths, the, the snake or the dragon is both a challenge and a reward. The challenge, of course, is probably most aptly and directly symbolized in the book of Genesis, the story of Eden. And what exactly does this myth refer to? Well, Eve is tempted by the serpent to eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. <coughs> the serpent, as I've said, symbolizes the energy of experience. So, to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil means to assess the energy of your experience in terms of positive and negative, to judge it, to say, this is good, this is bad, I like this, I don't like this. In Buddhism, of course, we have the fabled bad guys of attachment and aversion, which exactly refer to this same situation. If we approach our, the energy of our experience in terms of judging it, in terms of holding it to be this or that, and then in terms of, of, of attaching to it or repelling from it, or judging it to be good or bad, this causes what? We're expelled from the Garden of Eden. We're expelled from paradise. <coughs> which pretty, very, pretty specifically indicates that this simple mechanism of assessing the energy of your experience as this or that, assessing the energy of your experience as positive or negative, thinking you know what anything is and then, and then holding uh, uh, yourself just having a relationship with it, good or bad or whatever, uh, is the problem. It expels you from paradise. It, pushes you out of wholeness, out of perfection, into this sorry world of human suffering. <clears throat> then we have the other side of the symbolism, where the dragon is the guardian of the pearl of wisdom, or the guardian of a great treasure. <clears throat> and this indicates the vehicle or path of solving the problem of having judged our experience, of assessing our experience as this or that, instead of approaching it as the wholeness of energy that it is. <coughs> um, which, is, of course, is the key to the solution. By being with the energy of your experience without assessment, by being with it as energy, as a mysterious, unfathomable presence, as a, a dynamism, as a divine, radiant, inconceivable <coughs> uh, energy, then there is no way to form an idea of it clearly enough or 
or, or simplistically enough to, to assess it as good or bad. It's, is the sun good or bad? You know, is gravity good or bad? Is light good or bad? You know, these, these questions are meaningless. These, because the topic, this energy, this inconceivable energy that makes up our experience, is transcendental. There's no way we can know what it is. There's no way we can get a handle on it. And yet we do. We're arrogant. We think, oh no, this is, you know, this is this, this is that, this is a house, this is a city. I don't like this. I don't like that. I, I do like this. I want this. I don't want that. And by reducing this transcendental, inconceivable presence into imaginary, mundane, simple objects, which don't actually exist, we get expelled from the Garden of Eden. We get expelled from perfection. We get expelled from wholeness. And the solution, of course, is simply to be with the fullness of our, of the energy that presents itself as our experience, this inconceivable intelligence, this inconceivable radiance, this unstoppable presence that simply makes up the present moment, always, it's always right here, isn't it? Light is always shining in your consciousness, right? Thought is always wafting through your consciousness, right? All of these energies are just spontaneously present. You don't need to go out and get them. You don't need to create them. In fact, you can't possibly stop them. They autonomously and miraculously appear in the moment. And this energy that appears is inherently transcendental. It's inherently inconceivable. There's no way to get a handle on it. What is consciousness? Can anyone answer that question? What is consciousness? What is light? What is vision? What is thought? What is intelligence? These questions so obviously and manifestly have no specific answer. It's an absurdity to suppose we could, I mean, it's complete arrogance to suppose we could, oh yeah, I know what light is, sure. I know what thought is. I know what consciousness is. I mean, we know these things intimately because they are intimately present as our very being from moment to moment. We know these things most intimately. But you can't say what it is. You can't define it. You can't get a handle on it. And simply noticing the presence of this energy and noticing its transcendental nature <clears throat> is to recognize the dragon, to recognize the transcendental dragon, which is the guardian of the treasure, the guardian of the pearl of wisdom. And of course, the treasure and the pearl of wisdom is the wholeness that comes from this recognition, the simple recognition of this, of the actual transcendental nature of your very experience at this moment already. It always has been. It always has been inconceivable. And in this inconceivability, is miraculousness, is openness, is unstuckness, is intelligence, is meaningfulness, <clears throat> is complete transcendence of the human situation in any way that anyone could possibly define it. It's right here for you to discover simply by noticing it. It's nothing new. It has always been the case. We just need to notice what our experience actually consists of and notice that it does not satisfyingly collapse down to what we usually hold it to be. The essential spiritual problem turns out to be a very simple one. It consists of misidentification. <clears throat> we think we know what things are. We think we know what situations are. We think we know what beings are. We think we know what people are. We think we know what we are. We think we know what the world is. We think we know what objects in the world are. And of course, we have very intimate experience of all these phenomena. But if we look very closely, we will discover that there is an actual misidentification going on. For example, um, this is a cup, right? Everyone knows this is a cup. And yet, what is it actually? Well, actually, it's an experience. Okay, what is experience? What is experience? This is a very interesting question. What is experience? We all know experience intimately, obviously, because every instant 
our very being consists of nothing other than experience that we can find. But when you really ask the question and try and pin it down, what is experience? What does it actually consist of? What is it made of? What's happening? What event is it? What even category of event is it? We're stymied. You know, if we're honest, if we're intelligent, if we're unbiased with regards to that inquiry, we're stuck. It's, well, here it is, and we're, you, so we have intimate access to it. We can look at it very profoundly and very closely, but try and pin down exactly what it is. What is experience? Well, I'll be damned if I know. And in actual fact, if you look very closely at all the certainties that populate your life, your friends, your family, your environment, the, your possessions, the objects around you, the towns you live in, the world you live in, the universe you live in, your body, your thoughts, all of these phenomena on close examination resolve to nothing whatsoever than the presence of experience. And <clears throat> what exactly is that? So if we don't exam if we don't make this inquiry, if we don't examine these things in an unbiased fashion, then we just assume, oh, you know, I know what I know what matter is, I know what space is, I know what time is, I know what consciousness is, I know what the human beings are, I know what the world is. You know, it's because we have a lot of data points about all of these topics. We have a lot of experience. We have a lot of uh, density of textual experience on all of these sort of categories. But ultimately, if we look really close at all of this vast body of knowledge that we unexaminedly may think we have, that we may think resolves to something, we'll find that it doesn't actually converge to coherence. It doesn't actually amount to anything that pulls together. It doesn't amount to anything that, it has, that is convincing, except for the fact that any and all of it is demonstrably nothing whatsoever other than experience. And what is experience? What is experience? Well, we can't say. But if you can see that fact, if you can see the truth, the completely obvious truth that you've never experienced anything whatsoever other than experience itself, which comes in all of this, you know, intensely detailed patternings and colors and shapes and qualities and sounds and so on and so forth, right? Self-evidently. But you can't say what any of it is. Take the example of a dream. In a dream, you can have very precise, very present experience of all sorts of very detailed experiences, colors and shapes and sounds and textures and, and touch, thought, emotion, all of these things present in, in, in shockingly and realistically sharp detail, right? But what is present? You wake up and you realize, well, nothing was present but dreaming. What is dreaming? Well, dreaming is just a word for an arbitrary categorization of experience, right? A dream is a mode of experiencing. And when you wake up, you can see that there was nothing there but experience. There was nothing there but the dream. All the people and objects and environments and circumstances that populate our dreams, we wake up, poof, they're nowhere. And they never were anywhere even when we were experiencing them. And yet, they have presence as experience. Can you not say exactly the same thing about your waking experience? When you go to sleep, where does this world go? Poof, it's gone. <clears throat> So it's quite self-evident that we can know nothing other than experience itself, <clears throat> which is all very well and good. Um, but here's the kicker. You may have a subliminal idea that you know what experience is. So if everything is experience, okay, then what if there's no experience? What if you don't know what experience is? You know, if you resolve everything to experience and then snatch experience away, where are you? Where is this? What's happening? The very most profound, the absolute epitome of spiritual truth 
what realization is based on, what divinity is based on, what eternity is based on, all of these, you know, astoundingly elevated conceptions that we have. And all of this is about is nothing more whatsoever than what is right here, right now. <clears throat> all of it is the, the very pinnacle. There is nothing in actual spirituality which transcends what is right here. Not only that, but what is right here nakedly and obviously reveals what it is. Nothing is hidden, nothing is concealed, nothing is blocked. The only thing that can get in the way is if we think we know what it is already. Because then we only tend to see our preconceptions rather than accessing the actual information which is being clearly and freely displayed in the way that this is and what this self-evidently is. <coughs> in practical terms, the crux of the matter is <coughs> is being with your experience experientially or being with your experience situationally. Situationally means in terms of some explicit or implicit description. Situation. Here we are, we're sitting in a room, it's a spiritual meeting or talk or whatever it is. And we're in L.A., we're in Culver City, it's, uh, it's a Saturday. I mean, this is the situation, right? It's the story, the narration you would you would give about what's going on, you know, your name, you know, what, what your history is, where you were born, all of this, all of this sort of narration is all essentially situational. It defines an, an, uh, a, certain sort, a certain situation that you may hold to be more or less true, more or less objectively true, more or less accurate. And all of which is fine, as far as it goes. Um, but the turning point is that it doesn't actually go very far because and it prevents you from noticing what your experience actually is what's really here so you'll notice all those things you'll notice oh yeah this is Culver City this is Helen's house this is a spiritual talk you'll notice all those aspects but there's so much that is not being included in that narration there's so much that's not being included in that description and it becomes a sort of an automatic system of internal denial, an automatic censorship where we downplay the elements that don't f fit into the narrative and focus on the elements that do. Um, you know, it's a spiritual talk. Well, a very small portion of this is a spiritual talk. This isn't a spiritual talk. This isn't a spiritual talk. This isn't a spiritual talk. You know, so, so, so what, what about them? They're, they're people too. <laughs> you know. What about the dirt on the floor? What about the wind and the leaves outside? What about the light that's showing up in your field of vision? All these sorts of things. I mean, that's all very sort of heavy handed. But the point is to notice that these narratives that we typically hold to be more or less true are our jailers, are our ball and chain. Are, 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 are the enemy, are the devil, are Satan locking us in hell, or whatever sort of metaphor you want to pursue. These narratives are our are, are, are problem, spiritually speaking. And they're not a problem in the sense that you, you shouldn't do them. You know, forget you know how to speak English, forget you know how to think. That's not the point. The point is that, they are, is, is that it's possible to discover that your experience vastly transcends these narratives. I mean, and completely obviously so. This is not some esoteric, subtle doctrine. It's just completely obvious that your experience is inconceivably rich and profound and slippery and trippy and interesting and vibrant and alive and constantly changing and evanescent and spontaneous. Whereas these narratives are simplistic and dull and 
locked in and they're this and they're that. You know, this is either Culver City or it's not Culver City. But experience isn't like that, is it? Experience isn't locked in. Experience is very slippery. Every moment is just a symphony of nuances, a symphony of just feelings and vibes and thoughts and you notice this and that light shows up and all. You, know, you can't say. As soon as you start saying, it reduces to a narrative. It reduces to um, a situation. You're, you're being with your experience situationally instead of being with it irexperientially. And so if you start to look at your experience experientially, what can you notice? Well, as soon as I start talking about it, it's going to turn into uh, a, a, a situational instead of being with it experientially. But... Let's do it anyway. <laughs> um, so, you know, let's just take um, your field of vision for just the sake of discussion right now. Field of vision is full, isn't it? It's always full. Close your eyes. Field of vision is still full. It looks different, but it's full. Open your eyes, it's full. Someone enters the room. It's not more full. Someone leaves the room. It's not less full. You haven't lost anything when someone leaves the room, experientially. And situationally, you might. Oh my God, they're not here. What am I going to do? They're, you know, they're not here anymore. I've lost this contact. Situationally, things come and go. Experientially, nothing ever comes and goes. Experience is always full, isn't it? Experience is always completely full, completely present, completely complete. Um, for example, um, other aspects of experience that is very easy to notice is um, that it is um, what's a good way to put this? It escapes being specified even as it is very specific. <coughs> and this is a very important point. It's kind of hard to, to put because it's a little convoluted to try to verbalize it. But you can't say exactly what anything is definitively in your experience because it's, it's too much information and it's too slippery. So you look at someone's face and it looks exactly, it's not, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of specificity. I mean, your face looks exactly like it looks, right? It's not that it's some vague, cloudy, you know, nebulous thing and I can't see anything. On the contrary, there's an embarrassment of details. It's just amazing. <laughs> Color and shape and texture and, and form and contrast and all of this. So there is enormous specificity in experience. But, you know, in terms of describing it or in terms of logically, paradoxically, you can't say what any of it is. You can't say what any of the colors are. You can't say what any of the shapes are. You can't say what any of the textures are, even as they are very specifically present. It's not an either or. You're not denying their presence. You're not denying their specificity. On the contrary, what you're doing is noticing that there's more that just can't be included. And this sounds illogical, and it sounds paradoxical and contradictory, but if you look at your experience, you'll see this is self-evident. You know, there's just in your field of vision alone, there's an astounding amount of detail, right? It's just inconceivable, all the colors and shapes you see. I mean, just in a, in a tiny portion of it. But it's all... You can't say precisely what any of it is. And it's all mobile. It's all in motion. What you see in one instant is not what you see in the next instant. You know? And this, this, fights, this fights against the the uh, situational way of being with our experience of, oh, I'm looking at your face, it looks like your face. You know, in five minutes, it's still going to look like your face. Situationally, it's sort of locked in. It's very sort of stable and objective and it's not changing and it's just sitting there. But our experience isn't actually like that, is it? You know, try, this is a really easy experiment. You've probably, I'm sure you've done it many, many thousands of times in your life. Go into the bathroom, stand in front of the mirror, and just look at your face quietly without moving for a minute or two or five, and try and see what you look like. You know. And after a while, you'll think someone dosed your tea or something, because you'll be looking at them, you know, everything's changing, and it looks like this, it looks like that. You know, it's, it's a very easy experience to try, experiment to try, and it's completely obvious, the result. Um, and we know it with our faces, particularly, because we're, we're 
obsessed with self-identity and what we are and how we look to the world and all this sort of thing psychologically. But the same phenomena is observable in anything. I'm sure you've all heard me say many, many times, sit in front of a blank wall for five minutes with, with the lights on and just sit quietly and stilly and look at it. And after a while, you'll think you're watching a light show. You know, where did this still, stable wall that's supposed to be in there, sitting there go? You know, it's, it's, it, it's dancing, it's shimmering, it's coming in and out, your attention is moving around. The whole thing is completely, it's, it's, it's a total instability, it's a total spontaneous, flowing, morphing experience. And if you notice, I mean, we're talking about the field of vision now, but of course you can perform the same experiment with any of your senses or all of your senses or, or, or transsensual experience like, you know, sort of subtle mentality or whatever. I mean, we don't even have words for these things. But if you look at your experience in real time, you'll notice that, it, that anywhere you look in your experience, it partakes of these same qualities. This unfindability, undefinability, spontaneity, endless flowing and dynamism, vitality. I mean, this is, I mean, intuitively, this is how we know time is passing, right? Because even if things aren't changing very much, every instant your experience is completely different. Not just a little bit different, but you don't mistake one instant for the previous instant, do you? Because everything's different. I mean, maybe in, it, it, largely in subtle ways or in micro ways, but it's still experientially, it's self-evident that this is the case. And you can explore this, you can play with this. Um, another interesting facet of experience that's very easy to see is that things don't exist when they aren't in your experience. Where's your house right now? Except for Helen. <laughs> it's a thought. So it can it show up, might show up in your experience as a thought. You can have the thought of your house, but your house, it doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist, experientially. You may say, oh no, but it's really there, and when I go home, it's still going to be there. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but that's all st being with it situationally. Experientially, in real time, it doesn't exist. It might blow up and not be there in real time. It might have blown up five minutes after you left it and not be there in real time, and you don't know. So right now, you don't know if your house is there. You can expect it to be there. You can say, no, it probably didn't blow up, probably didn't burn. The odds are against, you know, it's probably sitting right there where I left it, and I'm going to go home. But you don't know. You know. And more profoundly than that, it literally does not exist if it's not in your experience. You don't exist if you're not in your experience. When you go to sleep at night, your whole life winks out. And you go into a dream and you, all of a sudden there's some other life. It can be a completely different situation. <laughs> Where'd this life go? Mm -hmm. It's not in your experience, so it doesn't exist. So, so experience sort of reinvents itself every instant is one way we might approach this. You know, what's true is true only in terms of an instant. What's real is real only in terms of an instant. For you, in terms of your experience. And of course, your experience is the only thing you have access to. I mean, I can say, oh, the house across the street is colored so-and-so, but if you can't see it, you don't know that. You know, and that not knowing it is, is more profound than just a simple fact. It literally does not exist. It's not a part of your world, experientially. So, so, so you, you, I don't know if you're, if you're getting the, the drift of this. So when you're with your experience experientially, it partakes of a lot of very, very, very different qualities than the typical qualities that we attribute to it when we're being with it situationally. You know, situation is we're in Culver City, you know, we're here, we're blah, 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 whatever, the whole narrative, right? And situationally, well, the houses across the street are there, and the streets are there, and LA's there, and it's all coming <coughs> along merrily doing its thing. That's a wonderful story, you know, and I'm not saying that that's not true, as far as it goes, but you're throwing out an awful lot of actuality for a lot of, of theory. Theoretically, LA is all there. Maybe it isn't. Maybe the aliens vaporized it. You know, there's a little force field around a one-mile circle right where we're sitting. I don't know. Maybe 
<laughs> probably not, you might say. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll agree, probably not, but maybe. And how would you know? Well, it's, it's not in your experience. You can't, can you? You can't. You know, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, we see this in we see this phenomena very explicitly in, in sort of news stories and headlines. You know, all the particularly with the sort of manipulative, heavy-handed media we typically have these days. You know, they they, they report a story and they report it, and, it's like, and you wonder, like, well, okay, that's interesting, but what really happened? You know, I wonder what really happened there. You know, and you know it doesn't have a whole lot to do with what they reported, but you don't know how much it doesn't have to do with what they reported. How how it might be completely different or wholly non-existent. You know, and and this is totally obvious to any thinking person. Um, but more intimately and more immediately, this is obvious in our moment-to-moment experience. If you look at your experience. The only thing you can know for sure is what you are knowing experientially right now. And of course you can't say what that is, because as soon as you say what it is, you oversimplify, you collapse it down to a narrative, you collapse it down to a hypothetical situation, which denies the incredibly information-dense and unanalyzable panorama of astounding presences and vibes and qualities that it actually is. <clears throat> what this is, what's going on here, is radically unlike what the normal consensus reality, human conception of it is. Radically and profoundly different and other than what the most advanced human thinkers think it is. <clears throat> Imagine you're in a dream Last night you're lying in bed dreaming, sound asleep, and you're dreaming. Now imagine you want to try and figure out what a dream is by following the plot line of what's going on in the dream. So there you are, and you're riding along on a horse or something, and there's people around you, and maybe some someone comes down on a magic carpet, or you know, whatever, just dream circumstances. And you're looking at all these things, and you're saying, well, here I am in the world where all this stuff's happening. What's going on here? You'd, you'd be looking at entirely the wrong conditions to get accurate information because what's going on actually has absolutely nothing to do with what seems to be going on except in the most profound way. If you have the wit to look at the way the dream is coming into existence in your consciousness, if you have the wit to look at the way presentation is occurring substantially rather than following the plot line along. And typically, as human beings, we don't do this, do we? We typically, it's like, well, here I am, and I'm in, I'm in this body, and I'm in this, my life, and I have my circumstances, and there's success and failure. And typically, we approach spirituality, I, I should say, perhaps the majority of people approach spirituality, as trying to get some sort of an augmentation, trying to get some foot up, trying to get some value added on top of that. So here I am as a human being, and let me just sort of polish, get a little polish on top, get a little, a little extra you know, that extra 10 or 20 percent that's like icing on the cake. And in actual fact, true spirituality consists of discovering that what you actually are and what you think you are and what you think this is, is completely and entirely other than what you have ever thought, what you have always thought it to be. Which may be one of the reasons why true spirituality is so rarely engaged in by people. Most people much prefer the sort of polite dabbling in spirituality where you go, to, you go to hear a speaker and you talk about how well they put it and then you go to see another speaker and you get a few books and you read them and you change your wardrobe and maybe you, you know, get an Indian name or something if you're really walking on the wild side. <clears throat> but to really take the plunge and really radically inquire, what is this? You know, what is this? What is going on here? What is happening? And most people don't go there because it's it's unsettling, to say the least. It's it's uh, you you leave the herd, you leave the tribe, you leave the comfort zone of people huddling together, reinforcing their own sort of mutual support system of, yeah, we're all in it together, and, you know, we're all, 
we're all living our lives and we're all fighting a good fight and we're all, you know, eating organic and we're, you know, saving the whales and oh, great, you know, by all means, you know, all of this stuff is fabulous, by all means do it, but it has absolutely nothing to do with what this is any more than the color of the horse you're riding on in the dream has to do with the fact that it's a dream. The interesting thing about experience is what it is, not what seems to be happening. And to look at what it is, you have to somehow bypass or let go of or somehow remove yourself from the context of what's happening. Because we're so conditioned to approach our experience in terms of the narrative, in terms of the interpretation, in terms of, you know, what's going on in this situation? Am I doing okay? Is, you know, are there any problems? You know, what's, what's the, where's the sparkle in the situation? Blah, blah, blah. <coughs> But what is the common denominator? What is experience itself? What is this astounding light show that shows up when you wake up every morning? You know, it looks different. Every instant it looks different. It never looks, never looks the same way twice. You've never seen these exact con context of configuration of experiences before, and you never will again. Every instant is absolutely unique. But so you can't get necessarily much of a hint from the, what it looks like, ex although this fact that it's absolutely inconstant is really interesting. And if you look very closely at an instant, even though it's gone by the time you look at it, you notice the astounding richness of information so much vaster and deeper and more luscious than we can possibly conceptualize. You know, and of course we're a conceptual chauvinist, we're the king of it as human beings. I mean we're just you know, we're really sharp. We can you know, I can I can come up with a thousand names for everything I'm seeing and all the colors they are and the shapes they are and descriptions and narratives about them and all sorts of sophisticated arguments and all this stuff. And that is so, so, so tiny a scratching the surface of the data density that is present in an instant of experience. You know, you look at someone's face, just the snapshot of someone's face in an instant, and how many colors are you seeing? How many textures are you seeing? You know, you, it, you can't quantify it. It's, it's infinite. It's literally infinite. So this is a very interesting quality of experience right away, the, the astounding richness of it. And it's always that way, isn't it? I mean, it's never not rich. Even when you, you close your eyes or you're going to sleep at night, you know, it may get sort of relatively undefined in terms of the precision that we're used to relating to our waking experience with, but it does, it's not like it gets less, does it? It's, there's this velvety thickness and richness and textural qualities, and it's subtle, but it's, it's always just astoundingly full astoundingly full, transcendentally full, f a fullness that could not possibly be captured in analysis. A fullness that could not, you could write an encyclopedia a day for the rest of your life and you wouldn't capture the fullness that's present in an instant of your experience. Mm -hmm. So, and this is accessible, it's completely obvious, you know, if we have the wit to notice it, well, and that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And the fact that all of reality is in your experience. It's very interesting. There's nothing whatsoever that's not in your experience. <coughs> so w where is your experience? What's it sitting on? What's it floating in? <coughs> Where's it coming from? How is it showing up? Where is it shining forth from? How is it experiencing itself? Mm -hmm. 
we can be with these issues very nakedly and very presently, but we, you can't be with them presently and nakedly from a conceptual point of view. You can't be with them presently and nakedly from the point of view of your usual narrative of who you are and what you're doing in your life and all that sort of stuff. Because that turns out to be very trivial and very, very um, partial as a description in terms of really addressing what is actually present here. So noticing the fullness of our experience, noticing the, the richness of our experience, noticing the inherently transcendental nature of experience in the, in the sense of the impossibility of capturing it as any sort of a simple phenomena. It's very subtle, it's very interesting, it's very slippery. And it's ex sublimely actual, it's sublimely and absolutely present and intelligent, the patterning of experience, you know, every, every photon perfectly in its place, nothing stepping on anything's toes, gravity working flawlessly, you know, the, the metabolism of the body just humming away, all these things just, you know, effortlessly and inherently, just like a, 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 a perfection of orderliness, a perfection of functionality, and it just comes with, you know, in an instant, bang, it's doing itself right now, in real time. All of that functionality is happening just always <coughs> right now, on this cutting edge of the moment. <coughs> So just to notice that the entire world, the entire universe, exists solely in your experience in a way that is absolutely inconceivable, absolutely unanalyzable, absolutely indescribable, and yet absolutely actual and accessible because it's right here, right now. You have It's completely nakedly present. It's completely available, this astounding fact, this one fact, this fact of being is always right here, right now. Its epicenter is you and the entire universe is its evidence and it exists in you and what's up with that? You know, I mean that's just the start, that's just the start of the investigation is, okay, that's, that's a given, so what is that? How far can you go into that? How far can you let go into what this really is and what it really implies? And if, if you have the drive, the inherent motivation to go there, to really ask these profound questions, then that's where you have to go. That's where you have to look. <coughs> anyway, um, that's sorry for my scattered ramblings. So um, uh, we can we can uh, discuss if you want, uh, or we can just sit around. I I recommend uh, uh, you know. As we talk, we won't be talking about words, we won't be talking about ideas, we'll always be talking about this present fact. And so I invite you and recommend that you keep revisiting this or stay with this astounding fact that is eternally occurring right here, right now. What Buddha realized what Jesus Christ realized, what Ramana Maharshi realized, what Neem Karoli Baba realized, what holy men throughout time have realized, 
is nothing other than this event that is happening right here, right now, as it actually is. And once you realize what this is, you get to participate in it as it is, which is called variously spiritual realization, liberation, um, so on and so forth. You realize that you are divinity, nothing other than divinity exists, not as an abstract notion or as a philosophy or as something to aspire to, but as a concrete fact. <clears throat> the only thing that can prevent you from realizing this and participating in this glory is your misunderstanding of it. Uh, if you have fantasies or imaginations of what you think it is uh, that you take to be true, then that will block you effectively from appreciating the, the astounding nature of what you are, of what this is. <clears throat> nothing other than that needs to change, nothing needs to be transformed, nothing needs to be developed. You simply have to notice what this is, you have to discover what this is in order to participate in the glory of it. <clears throat> uh, and as I said, the only problem, the only impediment whatsoever is imagination. And not imagination in itself, but the confusing imagination for reality. In other words, confusing your fantasies for what is actually the case. And doing so will effectively put a cork in the bottle, shut the genie in the bottle, it will shut magic out of your world, it will shut divinity out of your world, it will shut spontaneity and vitality out of your world, and you will tend to live in a world of suffering, smallness, pain, limitation, and uh, ultimately death. Whereas when you learn to distinguish between fantasy and actuality, you don't even need to stop fantasizing. Imagination is fine in its own place. The only problem is not being able to discriminate between fantasy and reality, between imagination and reality. When you learn to do that, you get to appreciate what this is, you get to participate in it as it is, you get to discover that you and this is an astounding, inconceivable, transcendental event that is beyond wonderful, <laughs> intrinsically, and has no problematic aspects, has no problems to be solved, has no impediments, has no limitations whatsoever, will never end, has never begun. It is eternal and it is absolutely beyond spectacular. That's the sales pitch. So, what does imagination look like? What does this imagination that causes such a dire problem consist of? It consists of thinking you know what anything is whatsoever. If you have a description for anything whatsoever that you think is more or less true, that's a sure symptom of fantasy, of imagination. If you have a name for some condition or object or some circumstance whatsoever that you think more or less accurately applies to the circumstance, this is a symptom of fantasy or imagination. Reality, as it actually is, is absolutely undescribable. It is absolutely unimaginable. So, as soon as you imagine it, as soon as you describe it, as soon as you define it, by definition, you are using your imagination to do so. You are taking something absolutely inconceivable and rounding it off and averaging it out to a limited concept that you can wrap your mind around, and then you're defining this inconceivability as being the limited condition that you are holding in your imagination and naming. All of which is fine until 
you take the extra step of thinking that that is actually true. This is a world. I am a human being. You know, um, this is life. You know, this is a microphone. If I actually think any of those things are true in any kind of a powerful sense at all, it's a sure sign that I am in delusion. I am in imagination. I am in fantasy. And I am not, by virtue of that fact, I am essentially blocking myself from appreciating the open-endedness and infinite dimensionality that reality actually consists of. Now, I'm using this word reality, which may sound very abstract and, and uh, you know, uh, absolute and refined, and it is actually absolute, but it's not abstract. By reality, what I mean, it turns out, is very close to what we mean by the word experience. Your experience is infinite dimensional. It is open-ended. It is indescribable. It is inconceivable. It, you, no way you can get a handle on any aspect of it whatsoever. Um, and as I said, as soon as you think you have, or, or even, you know, typically we don't notice it, we just assume we have, simply by thinking something is something, then that's a sure sign that we have cut ourselves off from noticing the spectacular, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful nature of this actual event and shut ourselves into a world of limitation, a world of smallness, a world of problems, a world of suffering, a world of frustration, and a world of limitation. And by doing so, we reap the reward of a life of essentially hell. We put ourselves into a living hell where we we suffer, we're in problems we can't find solutions to, and we're going to get old and sick and die. End of story. And none of that is actually true. But you can't avail yourself of that fact, that delightful fact, unless you can see it. And you can't see it as long as you confuse fantasy with reality, as long as you insist on defining things, describing things, and thinking that those descriptions and definitions actually apply. So it's, it's actually a very, very simple state of affairs. What makes it complicated, of course, is that we typically do all of this defining and describing and believing on an unconscious level, so we don't know we're doing it. We don't notice we're doing it. We typically think that things are the way we think they are, and we think we're more or less right, you know? I am a human being. This is Berkeley. This is a world, you know? This is Wednesday, blah, 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 all these various things. And instead of realizing that these are just designations of inconceivability, of absolute infinite dimensionality, if I think they refer to anything that is in any sense finite, or static, or concrete, or inert, I am cheating myself of my birthright. I am cheating myself of my own wealth, of my own bottomless fountain of vitality, of fulfillment, of creativity, of inspiration. So um, that's pretty much the whole shooting match. Every, every spiritual teaching you've ever heard, all spiritual discussion you've ever heard, every spiritual book you've ever re heard, read, is entirely wrong. Completely, completely, completely inaccurate. <clears throat> this is because this condition that obtains here, what's actually happening here, is entirely and completely undescribable. It cannot be described in words. It cannot be described rationally. It cannot be addressed even semi-accurately with human symbols. <clears throat> so as a result, all of these spiritual teachings are entirely misleading if they're taken at their face value, if they're taken at their 
superficial logical content at their, at their given semantic value. At best, all of these teachings can serve as a trick to enable you, in the course of grappling with them, to stumble onto that which is actually the case, which of course is completely available because what is the case is the case. It's right here. What, what this condition actually is, it is, you are it, you are completely engaged in it, so there is availability, there is a direct connection. But we are so typically so inundated in erroneous information, we are so inundated in various um, philosophies and, and in, 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 you know, implied philosophies and implied worldviews that we more or less accept some degree of some of it, you know, most typically. And in so doing, we are cut off from being able to appreciate what is here because what is here departs so completely, so totally, so absolutely fundamentally from anything that is expressible in human terms. <clears throat> so we're left with the interesting condition that all this spiritual teaching, which is intended, of course, to try to convey some of our condition in a useful way, most typically just completely confuses people because if you take any of it at face value, you are being led you know, up the primrose path. You are being led into something that is completely inaccurate, completely untrue. <clears throat> this is most fundamentally, this confusion is, and misunderstanding is most fundamentally engaged typically by the fact that we incorporate into our idea of what we are and how we work and the way we are even perceiving, um, we incorporate these erroneous ideas into that mode. So we, are, we tend to be approaching our very experience from an already incorporated wrong view. So we're starting from we aren't starting from neutrality, we're starting from error and we, and we already assume we are the error and we assume the way we're looking at our experience is in accordance with this erroneous understanding. So looking from that, from the context of that confusion, there's no way that the actuality can be discovered <clears throat> unless we have the good slash bad fortune or luck or grace or whatever to find ourselves somehow catapulted outside of that context, outside of the way we ordinarily hold ourselves to be and what we or ordinarily hold our experience to be, to discover the naked fact of what this is, which is so astounding, so completely inconceivable that it has never been expressed even remotely um, accurately even 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 hints at it are are so wide of the mark so in practical terms in terms of spiritual practice in terms of well well in that I mean in that case what do you do how do you work with this how do you try and approach this um, <clears throat> your greatest opportunity is to by hook or by crook find yourself outside of your ordinary frame of reference um, this can happen through extreme disorientation. This can happen through extreme fright or startlement. This can happen through um, <clears throat> various kinds of extreme behavior that um, precipitate us uh, unexpectedly into a new and radically different perspective. Uh, this can happen through through just through happen chance, through through just slipping through the cracks. I'm sure that we've all heard the famous story of the, the Zen monk who was raking up the leaves and his rake hit a rock and bang, just that impact did the trick. Why? Well, there's no why. That's the point. There is no why. There's no logic to it. There's no rationality to it. There's no explanation. There's no justification. But somehow he, he found himself outside of the, his normal context of what he holds himself to be unconsciously and what he holds this to be, and he was able to see it. And it's not hard to see. It's completely easy to see, in fact, because we're all completely immersed in it all the time. 
<clears throat> but we're also typically completely immersed in our worldview and our sense of ourselves. And this is usually the case unconsciously, so we aren't aware that this is a relatively <laughs> contrived stance that we're holding that we take to be objectively true. <clears throat> so we find ourselves thinking we are neutral, thinking we are clear, thinking we are in a state of objectivity where we're completely caught up, most typically, in holding ourselves to be profoundly other than we are, and holding this, this situation here to be profoundly other than it is. But of course, our good fortune is the situation is not actually other than it is. It actually is what it is. So reality is always right here. Our actual condition, our actual situation is completely nakedly displayed, is always available. What you are and what this is, is always completely accessible, completely unclouded, completely unblocked, completely clear. So, of course, at any moment, you can find yourself outside your accustomed frame of reference, and in that instant, what this is will be clearly seen. And, of course, in accordance with my original statements tonight, even these words are not true. <laughs> because the truth cannot be said. It cannot be accurately put. Um, we can have a discussion if you'd like to. Um, if you'd like to speak, there's a microphone you can speak into. Not that we necessarily need one in this little room, but there are people following along with this discussion online who would be interested to hear what you have to say. <clears throat> Hi. So um, you mentioned all you have to do is find yourself outside your normal frame of reference. Would you want to talk about how a person goes about doing that? Just to say by hook or by crook. You, how you go about doing that is any way that you can. Um, the, the symptoms of finding yourself outside of your frame of reference is you won't be able to say what anything is. You won't be able to think what anything is. You won't be able to think what you are. You'll find yourself being in experience but you won't be able to know anything precise about it. Anytime you think you know anything about anything or know what anything is or know what's happening to any degree whatsoever is a sure sign that you are in confusion, that you are wrong, that you are in a frame of reference which exists only in your imagination and which is not actually obtained. So any kind of experience or functioning which places you in a condition of relative unknowing is a potential uh, a, a, a potential point of, of easier access to noticing this actual condition. And of course, typically, at first, it'll be very disorienting because it is so radically different from the normal human worldview. Um, very often, people stumble onto this and, they, and they, they find it very uncomfortable or they get very nervous or they, get, they go a little crazy or they, they, they get uh, very fearful. Um, this is very common, because what this is, is so strange in comparison to the normal human worldview. Even when we're in the midst of thought, we're in non-thought experience. Um, and this becomes really obvious. Um, if you go to a museum, say, and you see a striking work of art, what is it that, about it that makes it striking? It's not a thought or a word, there's some intangible presence, some flavor, some quality that you can't possibly capture accurately in words that is present, that is moving. And well, this is a clear example of presence that is beyond thought. Or say you see a gorgeous sunset and you just look at it and you go, wow. And of course you can think, oh, this is a sunset and you can think a lot about it, but at the same time you're very directly aware of a presence that is 
that transcends thought, that transcends analysis. You know, the beauty of a sunset, of a gorgeous sunset is undeniable, but it's not logical. It's not conceptual. It's not an argument. It's not a thesis. It's simply a present fact. It's an irrational present fact that is what it is, and uncapturably so in words or ideas. I mean, how, you know, you, how many poems can you read about sunsets? You know, do any of them look like a sunset? I don't think so. So, so we have constant access to these kinds of experiences. You know, every moment of our of our waking life, if we have the wit, intelligence, luck, or grace to appreciate them, to notice them, to look the other way from where we're usually obsessively looking in our storylines and our arguments and our and our narrative, and notice that there's always you know, present something else. There's always present just astounding qualities which are completely ungraspable, completely inconceivable, completely undescribable. You know, you see you see a beautiful face. You know, it's that's not logical. I mean you can say, Oh, I just saw a beautiful face but that the saying that that sentence is not the beautiful face. The beautiful face is an actual present reality that completely transcends logic. It, it transcends conceptualization. It's not beautiful because you're thinking about it or you have clever words about it. It's beautiful because it's just plain a presence of beauty. And what can you say about beauty? You know, it's 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 a mystery. Uh, you know, mystery sim is simply a synonym for. You cannot describe it. You cannot get your hand, get your head around it rationally. So we have constant access to this kind of experience if we allow ourselves to appreciate it, if we allow ourselves to notice what it is and what is there. We can find ourselves in this inherently transcendent condition that inherently transcends the human worldview in every regard. When one, when one begins to get serious about spirituality, it's easy to have an exaggerated notion of what it consists of and what the goal of spirituality is. Typically, you may look at your own life and see it as normalcy, as drudgery, as plodding along in um, a, a humdrum, mundane sort of, a, of an existence. And... You may imagine that spirituality is somehow some amazing transcendence of that condition or a solution to the problems that seem to present themselves in that condition or a, um, a, some, some kind of a condition that contrasts extremely with the relative smallness and unsatisfying nature of uh, sort of uh, normal human life of a consensus reality kinds of an existence. And so it's easy to imagine this transcendental, wonderful condition where all of a sudden you won't have to pay taxes anymore and you won't need money and you know the angels will be singing and carrying you around and bringing you manna from heaven and all this sort of thing. Which of course would be very nice, wouldn't it? Interestingly, the truth of spiritual reality is both much less than that fantasy and much more than that fantasy. It is much less than that fantasy in the sense that it turns out that the goal of the spiritual path, the actual, the actual condition that one realizes when one has successfully accomplished the spiritual quest, the spiritual search, turns out to be exactly where one started. You are still in your life. You are still a human being. You, are, you still have to pay taxes or not. <laughs> you still you know, have to go to the bathroom. You still have to get food. You still have to maneuver through life. 
And this, of course, may seem to be much less than one might expect of this glorious transcendental condition that one would hope one would somehow transfer into or transit into as a result of spiritual realization. So in that sense, it is much less. But it is also very much more than that fantasy because one discovers that what this so-called normal life actually consists of is absolutely inconceivable. It is a surpassingly strange condition, a surpassingly uh, fascinating condition, a condition that is nothing other than awe-inspiring, insp <coughs> while yet being just normalcy. Because, of course, it turns out that normalcy is not actually normalcy. Normalcy is not actually humdrum. Normalcy is not actually the, the pathetic horror of normal life that many people may think that it is. Normalcy is an astounding, inconceivable condition of transcendental force existing in infinity, you know, the, um, the goal of what physicists pursue is the same goal that is realized at the end of the spiritual quest, the unified field, you know, the, the, uh, the true nature of reality, which of course is in full effect right here, right now. This is the goal of the scientific quest and the spiritual quest. This is this astounding condition, uh, which of course is indescribable in present scientific terms, although they have gone to great strides to erect elaborate theories in an attempt to describe it, um, admirably so, but failingly. <laughs> and likewise is equally indescribable in other terms, although again, in spiritual texts and sacred books and so on and so forth, the words of holy men, all sorts of various fabulous, poetic and evocative descriptions and technical descriptions full of Sanskrit phrases and so on have been put forth in an attempt to try to indicate this, but failingly because what this is cannot be captured in ideas, it is unthinkable, it is literally unthinkable, it is inconceivable in the sense that conception cannot capture what this is. Conception cannot capture the reality of the presence of light. Conception cannot capture the reality of the presence of consciousness. Conception cannot capture the reality of the presence of being. This is, these phenomena are a simple present fact in everyone's experience, and yet it cannot be said what they are. They are absolutely beyond description. Modern science fails, although again with these admirable and very elaborate theories and measurements and uh, mathematical formulations and so on and so forth. Wonderful approximations, but they miss the mark. And likewise, all of these wonderful sacred text, as evocative as they are, haven't said the last word, haven't said what this actually is. Of course, it already is what it actually is. The goal of the scientific quest is in full effect right here. This is reality. This is, this phenomena right here is what scientists aspire to understand, aspire to to describe. You don't need to go to the core of stars, you don't need to go to distant galaxies, you don't need to smash atoms, because what you find when you pursue those avenues of investigation is just exemplifications of exactly the conditions that are in full effect right here, right now. And the same thing applies from in the terms of a spiritual paradigm what the goal of the spiritual quest is, is this reality that is omnipresent, is always the case, 
It has not gone anywhere. It never will go anywhere. It is what it is, inalienably, and it is com completely beyond description. <coughs> In practical terms, the greatest impediment to begin to explore what this present reality consists of is the fact that most of us already think we know what it is. Um, generally unconsciously, so it's, and hence unexaminedly, we don't challenge our own notions. Oh, it's just the world, it's just space and time, you know, it's just light. And it's just consciousness, you know, it's a byproduct of the central nervous system, you know, so on and so forth. All of these, you know, formulas that are just held to be true, they're self-evident. Well, of course this is just space, this is just time, this is just gravity, this is just light. You know, this is the four fundamental forces of the universe. This is, you know, electromagnetic fields interacting. This, I mean, depending on how sophisticated your modeling of what this is, um, you'll have s typically some way of holding it to be something. And we don't usually go far enough in so our self-examination to notice that in actual fact we don't have a clue what any of these things are. And these claims to knowledge, these claims to understanding, are in actual fact just empty formulations. You know, consciousness is a byproduct of the central nervous system. Okay, that sounds really good, doesn't it? It sounds meaningful, it sounds pithy. Does anyone, what does it mean? <laughs> what, what is the central nervous system? <laughs> you know, the fact of consciousness is self-evident. What it is, is entirely elusive in terms of describing it or understanding it. The fact of the central nervous system, likewise, is equally mysterious. What is the central nervous system? Well, you know, it's biochemical systems. It's matter interacting in, in accordance with DNA and, and chemical properties and so on and so forth. Okay, well, that's very impressive, but what is that? You know, well, gosh, you know, now that you mention it, I don't really know. So... Having said, having claimed that this is consciousness is simply that, I haven't said anything with any content because I don't really know what these notions refer to. No one knows what these notions refer to. You could get the greatest Nobel Prize winning scientists that ever lived all together in this room and ask any one of them, what is consciousness? What is matter? What is energy? And to a man or, and or woman, they would say, well, we don't really know. You know, we can say a lot about it. We have a lot of very sophisticated theories and measurements and mathematical formulas that describe aspects of the way it, it, it seems to be when we observe it, but we don't really know what it is. We don't really know how it is. We don't really know how it works. And it turns out that this admission of ignorance is the beginning of true investigation. Because of course, if you think you already know what something is, you're not gonna look very hard at examining what it is because you're, you're already convinced you know. It's like trying to convince someone who's a, a, an affiliate of a, a, of a political party that their views are wrong. They, they already know they're right. So you're gonna argue with them and and it's not going to, it's not liable to do a lot of good, is it? You know, and, and likewise, these sorts of worldviews that we typically hold unconsciously, and we don't even know we're holding them, typically. We, we just accept that it's true that these things are the way that they are, and I sort of more or less know what that is. You know, no, matter is matter, consciousness is consciousness, space and time are space and time, you know. It's all from the Big Bang, or whatever, right, you know, whatever degree of elaborate theory you sort of are resting on. So, the beginning of actual investigation is noticing that in actual fact, 
you don't really know what anything is. You don't know what anything is to any degree. And that is a very good starting point for accurate investigation because then you can begin to explore unbiasedly. You can begin to explore with genuine curiosity and you can begin to assimilate the actual evidence of your experience outside of the context of these a priori theories and a priori worldviews that just constipate our understanding. They completely blocks our approach to what is going on here. <clears throat> All our problems come from misinterpreting what's going on here. It's, it's very, it's very simple. It's, a, it's just a case of, of uh, jumping to conclusions. Um, inaccurate. All our problems, all our personal problems, all our emotional problems, all our spiritual problems, all spiritual conundrums simply come from mis a misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Of course, we draw our evidence for what's going on here from our experience. So here we are, we're born into this world, into this bizarre experience, and you know, there's no... Um, there's no... Uh, Manual. There's no explanation. There's no rule of instructions. There's no map, and we're given all these hearsay maps by our parents and our society and you know, various books and philosophies and what have you. And we sort of pick and choose to the extent we can, or more likely, we just have all these random things imposed on us that we just sort of latch onto. And um, out of all of this information, we cobble together some kind of an interpretation of what's going on here, which becomes more or less our worldview, how we approach our lives, what we think we are, what we think the world is, what we think the, is, what the event is here, that's what the purpose of it is, what, you know, what the strategy is of how to go about approaching all this and making sense of it and, and engaging with it and so on. <coughs> But the fact is, we get it wrong. You know, it's it, it, not just a little wrong, completely wrong, entirely wrong. You know, it's um, it's a very, very rare, probably inconceivably rare event for someone to just be born into this world and see what it is clearly and actually be able to settle into that. Most of us just, whoop, we're just off and basically in total insanity, where we have an interpretation of what's going on. It's just completely wrong. It's well-intentioned. We do our best, you know. We, we try to um, work with what we have as intelligently as we can. But what's, what is actually happening here is, is beyond the scope of the tools that we have to try to understand it because the tools that we have to try and understand it is human semantic systems, ideas, words, concepts, all of these sorts of things. Um, and so we have all of these descriptions that are more or less verbal, and of course there's obviously a lot of nonverbal component, emotions and what have you. But you know, we have all of these words and names for things. We have nouns and verbs and all of this, and oh, I am a person, and I'm in a place, and I'm doing this, and you know, all these so, so we have all of these sorts of, of very heavy-handed verbal conceptual ways of describing what's happening or what things are or what things consist of. But what is here turns out not to be amenable to that kind of description because what it is is of an entirely different order than things and actions. You know, if, if language was accurate, you would think that, well, verb, no, nouns would correspond to things that actually exist as, as the things in the way that the noun suggested it ought to, you know. Things would be what, what we, more or less what we, 
would accord more or less with what we name them and what we call them and what we think of them as being. And we would think of actions as likewise as more or less existing in the way that we describe them, in the way that we name them, in the way that we designate them. But this is entirely untrue. It's just not what's actually here turns out not to conform to that. So it's no wonder we get it wrong because the tools we are naively and innocently, you know, um, introduced into <coughs> using to try to make sense of this are the wrong tools for the job. It's like we've been given a set of wrenches and we're doing we're supposed to be doing brain surgery. It just ain't gonna work. It's too heavy handed. <coughs> So typically as a result, we, we approach our lives in terms of our understanding of it, which again is, is going to be flawed, it's going to be erroneous to a greater or lesser degree. And so things don't work out perfectly, you know, our, the, our world and our life and our experience just somehow doesn't seem to line up very precisely with the way we're approaching it, and we, we get in these conundrums in our lives that, that, that are our best efforts uh, of working with in the ways we usually work with things just doesn't seem to click doesn't seem to cut it and then you know if we find ourselves at a certain point of maturity we begin to question well maybe you know maybe there's something else going on here maybe there's there's more to this that somehow you know I'm not including in my in my methods of trying to to, to be what I am and we might turn to spirituality or various other sorts of alternative approaches to this to an attempt to try to discover what's actually going on. Giving the tea a moment to kick in. <laughs> wake, wake, wake up my adult brain. <clears throat> Fortunately, our advantage is that even though we typically we're saddled with this misunderstanding that we've accumulated over the course of our lives, um, we also are, of course, in direct experience. We are in the reality of what this really is. <clears throat> so even though we, again, conceptually or philosophically, may have a, a really skewed view of things, we do have this advantage that we actually have our context is reality itself. We are real. We exist. We are what we are already. And even if we have a, a even if we misunderstand what that is, nonetheless, the fact is the case. So we have access to it. We have um, immediate access to what this really is, what we really are, because of course it's been the case all along. Misunderstanding it doesn't make it into something else. Misunderstanding doesn't make reality unreal. Of course, it just makes it, it makes our understanding of it inaccurate. So, we, because we do have access to reality, we have this opportunity to actually notice it and engage with it as it is to the extent we can bypass or somehow set aside our expectations of what it is and our brainwashing of what we're so used to holding it to be and holding ourselves to be and so on and so forth. <clears throat> mm. 
So what is the basic fact? What is our starting point for investigating this? It is, of course, experience. This is here. This is really happening. This is what we call experience. is an actuality. <coughs> and all, if we look at it, all of our ideas about this, all of our philosophies and conceptions and worldviews about what we are and what this is, has been extracted from experience itself, from this actual evidence of experience. So the fact that we may have not done a perfect job of it, you know, um, unintentionally, you know, uh, is is addressable. You know, we can look at it because we can go back to the root information. We can go back to the actual condition of being with our experience um, directly, not in the context of how we're used to holding it to be. Provided that we can stumble onto how to do that, provided that we can stumble onto how to bypass it, somehow let go of our bias, our beliefs that we generally hold to be objectively true about what things are, what we are, what this is, what's going on here, um, which can be um, formidable. You know. um, reality is actually very easy to find. It's our unreality that's hard to let go of because we're so typically unconsciously we just hold these things to be true. We just we just you know if it was if these were conscious logical positions we could we could criticize them we could argue with them we could debate with them we could go back and look and see if it's true and sort of sort it out very logically. But it's not like that, is it? You know, we 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 tend to hold certain things as a deep belief unconsciously that is just held to be a certain way unquestioningly and it's very difficult for us to question it because it seems like we're going against truth we're going against obviousness some things are just very obvious it's very obvious no I have a body it's very obvious no I'm separate from the world it's very all these kinds of things are we may hold to be very obvious and it's hard to criticize them logically because we look at that and it feels true. And you can say, well, you know, it's, it's, it, what if it's not? What if it's something else going on? But it feels like, well, that's pretend. This is, this is real. No, this body is real. This, this world is real. All these things are real. The way, because we, we hold them to be that way unconsciously as a, as a, a feeling, as a, a, a something that is just, is a, is a truth. It's held to be true. And so these, these, these holdings, these sort of unconscious beliefs um, can be uh, a challenge to try to question, to try to bypass. So this is where all of these tricks and spiritual practices and all of these come in, where we're basically trying to stumble on effective mechanisms, effective techniques to either bypass or, or plow into or somehow address these powerful holdings of holding things to be a certain way. But again, it's not an insoluble problem, as, as of course we all know. You wouldn't be here unless you didn't have some evidentiary, some degree of evidentiary experience in your life that, wait a minute, there's more here, there's, there's something else going on here, there's other aspects of things then and it's usually held to be the case in sort of normal consensus worldviews. <clears throat> because we do have absolute, intimate, direct access to reality, to the actuality of experience, to the actuality of this energetic presence that constitutes what we call experience. <clears throat> and because we do have this, we, have, we may have some awareness of that, even if it <coughs> seems jarring or, or, or somehow anomalous in the context of the way we're used to, you know, our sort of conceptual or belief structure, worldview of things and so on. So the trick is to be able to capitalize on that, to take advantage of these cracks in our worldview, to take advantage of these direct experiences of actuality that somehow don't fall in the category of 
what we usually can explain or describe or, 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 or assimilate in any se- in any context as making any sense as as being a part of the the normal you know the normal common sense view of things. So this is our advantage: is that we do have direct experience. So in practical terms, the challenge is to stumble on to how to take advantage of these direct contacts and how to be with our direct experience in a powerful enough way that it will show us what it is and essentially um, wean us away from our addiction to our accustomed way of holding things our accustomed way of defining what we are and what this is. (coughs) One of the very easiest tricks, one of the very easiest ways to do this is to, to notice that if something is describable, if you think you can say or think or, or get a handle on what something is, that's a sure sign that you're wrong. That's a sure sign that that is fantasy. That's illusion. That's imagination. Because reality is intrinsically undescribable. Reality is intrinsically multidimensional. Reality is intrinsically ambiguous and indeterminate. Reality is intrinsically open-ended and not amenable to any kind of a comprehensive description. So, this one simple fact is very powerful because, of course, we all have broad <coughs> aspects of experience where we can go to them and and we're with this experience, we're with these qualities, but we can't say what it is. And that's wonderful. That's a good place to be. That's a good place to look because then you are with actuality and you can have it show you directly what it is and how it works in non-conceptual, non-verbal terms. It's not like you're going to be able to translate reality into logical terms. It ain't never going to happen. It can't happen. Because again, it's just a mismatch. Um, Human ideas and human conceptions cannot accurately reflect reality. It cannot be done. Truth cannot be said. So anyone saying something, right away you know that if their lips are moving, they're spouting lies. It's inaccurate. It's not going to be true. Because truth cannot be said. Truth cannot be thought. But it doesn't need to be said. It doesn't need to be thought. It needs to be lived. And of course, we're living it all the time, 24-7. We are living reality. We are living truth. And the simple challenge of the spiritual quest is just to notice this fact. And as we notice it more and more deeply, more and more comprehensively, we begin to notice what it is. Again, not in conceptual terms, not in terms we can describe, but in terms that are profoundly intelligent, profoundly meaningful. Intelligence is not dependent upon logic. Intelligence is not dependent upon concepts. Intelligence is not dependent upon words. On the contrary, the the intelligence that is nonverbal is profoundly vastly superior to the intelligence that can be squeezed down into words and ideas. You know, this all this is the archetype of the egghead, you know, with the slide rule of well, I'm showing my age here, in his pocket and and he's uh, uh, you know, and he's <coughs> spouting all this mathematics and stuff. That's not intelligence. That's a very low level of intelligence. You know, you see someone dancing, you see someone singing, you see someone enjoying a sunset. That's intelligence. It's open-ended engagement with multidimensionality, with vitality, with actuality. And it's self-verifying. It reveals what it is. It shows you what it is. And in the context, it shows you what you are. Because, of course, the idea that there's an it and a you is just conceptual. Right? When you're with a beautiful sunset, it's not like the sunset's over there and you're over here. It's just happening. It's this. Right? It's just this, this event that does not have partitions, it does not have borders, it doesn't have separations and walls. 
you, know, you can't find where I end and it begins. It, right? It's just this field of amazingness, this field of astounding. But you can't say what it is. And the fact that you can't say what it is is a good indication that it may be a direct revelation of reality. Mm-hmm. Or let's put it the other way around. If you can't say what it is, <laughs> you're creating a fantasy. You're creating an oversimplification. Because the actuality of the way reality works is that it is infinite. Literally infinite. It's a mathematical infinity, a, a metaphysical infinity. It is a subtlety. It's multidimensional. It's not this or that. It's not. It's not one or the other. It's not a simplicity. It's a subtlety. It's a complexity. It's a. <coughs> it's an indeterminacy. And as soon as you specify it, oh, it's this or oh, it's that, you're trying to collapse that indeterminacy, that paradoxical infinity, down to a simplicity. And when you do that, you create a stick figure. You know, it's like a, it's like a kindergartner draws a, a, you know, a line like this and a line like this with a circle on top and says, "That's mommy." No, well, that's not mommy. <coughs> you know, it's 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 a couple of lines on a piece of paper. Mommy is um, a little bit more than that. You know, and likewise, <coughs> this presence here is vastly more than our descriptions of it. It's vastly more than our ideas of it. It's vastly more than anything that can be said about it. And again, the fact that we are already completely immersed in it, we, in fact, we are it, it is us, we are this experience, this vast field of experience that's always right here, it means we have access to it, we can notice it, we can learn to shift our way of relating to this being to direct openness, to sort of a free fall of, of textual engagement versus this sort of insisting on narrations, insisting on definitions, insisting on saying this is this and that's that and I'm this and you're that and all of these sorts of over, vast oversimplification stick figures that human ideas of what's going on here always consist of. So that's an overview of um, (coughs) all of this spirituality business. And in practical terms, of course, the question becomes, well, here, in my situation, what does that look like? In my situation, what am I tripping over? In my, or not? You know, in my situation, um, what does that mean? What does that imply? What, 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 <coughs> what happens? How do I work with this? How do I work with that? All of that. Because, of course, this is not a matter of theory or philosophy. This is a matter of your life. This is a matter of you engaging with what you really are, with what this really is, um, as fully as is your birthright, because you are it. Why not have full access to what you are? Why not let yourself notice what you are and participate in it fully multidimensional? And so this becomes our challenge individually, is, okay, how does this work in my life? How is it working in my life? How does it seem to be not working in my life? And what's up with all that? And um, we can talk about that. 